Narratives, Archives and Knowledge Transfer, Making History Accessible is the title of today's symposium. Good morning and good afternoon to all guests. This is the third event of the project Dippling Architect, German trained Indonesian architects from the 1960s. The first event was the symposium between past and future new forms of design, construction and material cultures, which took place two weeks ago and will soon be available on our website. The second event took place on Monday this week, the opening of the exhibition Dippling Architect, German trained Indonesian architects from the 1960s at Taman Ismail Matsuki in Jakarta. The show will be open to the public until 12 January 2023. My name is Edward Kögel and I'm part of the curatorial team and one of the initiators of the platform Encounters with Southeast Asian Modernism, which is dedicated to the exchange on modern architecture between Germany and Southeast Asia. With us in the virtual space are Sally Bello and Moritz Henning, currently in Jakarta, my Berlin partners at the Encounters project. <clears throat> now let me briefly introduce our work with the Encounters platform. The project began in 2019, when Germany celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus. In this context, we opened up the perspective from Europe to Southeast Asia. In August 2019, we invited architects, curators, artists, and academics from Southeast Asia to Berlin. Later that year, exhibitions, symposia, workshops, architectural tours, and film screenings that negotiated how to deal with post-colonial colonial modern architecture were curated by teams in Jakarta, Phnom Penh, Singapore, and Yangon. In 2021, we could show all the contributions in Berlin, supplemented by a chapter on the architecture and planning export of East and West Germany to the region from the 1950s to the 1980s. The exhibition entitled Contested Modernities Post-Colonial Architecture in Southeast Asia was shown at the Haus der Statistik, a late East German modernist building that was saved from demolition through the commitment of civil society in the center of Berlin. It was accompanied by a publication uh, from ARC Plus and four symposia. You will find the documentation on our website. Today, we meet in this symposium, Narratives, Archives and Knowledge Transfer, Making History Accessible, which is part of our new project, Dibbling Architect. In 2019, we talked in Berlin with Avianti Armand and Setia Disupanti, the curators of the Indonesian contribution to the Encounters project. We knew that some of the architects who were instrumental in shaping modern Indonesian architecture since the 1960s had studied in Germany. In the archives of the Architecture Museum of the Technical University Berlin, we discovered a photographic documentation of the diploma projects of nine Indonesian architecture students who graduated in 1960 and 1961. This finding was the inspiration for our project that consists of an exhibition which started on 12 December in Jakarta, a publication that will come out at the end of this year, and two symposia on 1st December and today. In the coming few minutes, I will give you an insight into the forthcoming publication. The book will be published by Dome, Dome Publishers in Berlin. Like the exhibition itself, it was a very ambitious project that had to be written and edited in a short, in a very short time parallel to the creation of the exhibition. Moritz Henning and I are the editors. Steli Belo, Avianti Amand, and Setiadi Supandi advised us. But without the great help of the wider research teams in Jakarta, it would not have been possible to put the materials in a book. A critical appraisal of individual buildings or the life's work of a single architect could not be done here. 
This is because the material mostly comes from private archives and are being shown publicly for the first time. What remains is a scholarly reappraisal with, for which this book will certainly form a basis. You see here two title pages. The upper one shows how the book will come into the bookshops. Below, that is the edition that was supposed to be the catalog for the exhibition. <clears throat> that was a bit too ambitious, but it is underway. And hopefully we will soon, it will soon arrive. Now to the concept of the book, we have divided the material into five topics. First, we present the context of the studies in Berlin, Hannover and Aachen, where the architects studied. This also includes an overview by Setiadi of the political, economic and cultural development in the second half of the 20th century in Indonesia. This is followed by a documentation of the diplomas that we found in the archive of the Architecture Museum in the TU Berlin. Next to the biographies of the eight, eight architects we have focused on in this book, Han Awal, Herianto Solintro, Jan Beng Ui, Mustafa Pamunchak, Suyu Divic Yamoto, Biampuen Suwondo Bismo Suchedo, and Yusuf Biljata Mangun Vinchaya. We could only briefly mention the other four of the 12 architects mm -hmm. for various reasons. Eddie Hariati, Hema Chakradiatmo, Pohin Tung, and King Han Ui. Under the title positions, Han texts Oi. by Han Aval, Mangun Vinchaya, and Bian Pon follow, which are made available here in English for the first time. There were, of course, many more texts by the architects. We will soon make some of them available online in English on our website. In addition, the photographer William Suntando has photographed a number of the architect's buildings in Jakarta and the surrounding area. In Germany, Moritz Bernoulli photographed the buildings of Jan Beng Ui in southern Germany, most of which are published here for the first time. I compiled a few pages of this publication here to show a possible narrative through the book. In the top left corner, we see the German pavilion of the 1958 World's Fair in Brussels, which illustrated a new attitude in, in architecture in West Germany that clearly set itself apart from the architectural language of the National Socialists. Below them, you see the diploma project by Bianpoen in Hanover, who dealt with the cemetery with a cemetery in Indonesia and choose an open pavilion system for it. As with all the other diplomas, whose location incidentally was always in Indonesia, the question of adaptation to climatic condition played an important role. The priest Yusuf Biljata Mangun Vinchaya studied in Aachen. There was a relatively strong Catholic Church and the Rhenish Westphalian Technical University. There were a number of professors who taught church building. After the war, many of the architects designed churches and searched for new concepts. When we look at the pictures below, above, and at Mangun Vinchaya's later buildings, it becomes clear that his, that his inspiration came from his teachers, among others. Most of the Indonesian students came to Berlin from Delft because of Hans Sharon. However, it was not possible to take a diploma with Sharon because he taught urban planning. Therefore, the Sharon students went to the chair of Professor Wilhelm Kreuer, where they were obviously inspired by Sharon's ideas on architecture, as we see here in the diploma thesis of Eddie Heriati. Most of the students never saw the masterwork of Hans Sharon, the Philharmonie, here on the left in its finished state, but Jan Beng Ui built models for it in Sharun's office during his time as a student. 
Bian Pan studied in Hanover. He went there together with Suwondo because the war ravaged city was the subject of contemporary discussion with a radically modern concept of construction. Presumably, Bian Pan, who also worked in the Hanover city administration before his return, took the radical attitude with him and applied it to his extraordinary church buildings. We see here on the church, we see here one of the churches on the bottom right. Of the 12 architects, two remained in Germany, one in Switzerland and one in the Netherlands. Jan Beng Ui stayed in Germany and was able to set up his own successful office through public competitions. Unfortunately, his buildings were never published and not professionally photographed. We have therefore commissioned the photographer Moritz Bernoulli to document some of the buildings, like here, the Lindenhalle in Ehingen on the right side. Herianto Sulindro, whom I would like to congratulate today on his 94th birthday, went to Zurich in Switzerland in 1963 after working in Hamburg where he worked in the city administration until his retirement. On the side, he designed some residential buildings in Ticino for friends. He was the only one who could be present at the opening on Monday, as he moved back to Indonesia a few years ago, where he now spends his retirement. Han Aval is one of the most prominent architects of this group, and he was involved in, in many areas. He cooperated with Suyudi, with Mangun Vichaya, with Bian Pwen, and last but not least with Mustafa Pamunchak, with whom he had a partnership over many years. Han Aval was also involved in the preservation of historic buildings and renovated some colonial area buildings, engaged in education and public discourse. So Yudi, who had also studied in Berlin, is mainly remembered for his large-scale buildings for the government and administration. On the left below, we see some buildings from Berlin and Düsseldorf, where he worked for Hendrik and Pechnik. On the right below, you can see buildings from Berlin in east and west, but above all, the Congress Hall by American architect Hux Stubbins. In a different form, the curved roof can also be found in his work in Jakarta, as we see above on the right. A very significant contribution are the new photographs by William Sutando, who captured the buildings in their present context. Here it becomes clear how they have survived the, te survived the test of time, but also what spatial and material qualities they contain. This is where one can start when discussing preservation and or demolition. Of course, we could not document everything that was found by the different teams in this book. In part, it was simply too much. In part, it still needs time to prepare a proper documentation. After all, we are talking about a whole work life of the architects that is now in boxes and crates and to which access must first be found. This project is only a first step. I would like to thank all those who have contributed to this publication and hope it will inspire the younger generation to do further research. Before now, before I now leave the screen, I would like to mention another issue. This exchange about Indonesian architectural history offers a great potential. It would be a waste not to make use of the experience avail available on both sides. It was for reasons like this that Indonesian students came to Berlin almost 70 years ago. And it is exactly how we can look at Indonesia today. I only want to mention the building of the new capital in Kalimantan and the experience we gained here in Germany after reunification and the move of the government from Bonn to Berlin. What to do with the old government facilities is an open question. Finally, I'd like to thank those who made the project possible. 
it was the federal the German Federal Foreign Office that accepted our proposal as part of the program to celebrate the seventh 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Germany and Indonesia and provided us with funding. We would also like to thank the Archive and Architecture Museum of the Technical University of Berlin for keeping the work of the Indonesian students and providing us with further information on the architectural education back then. Now, I would like to hand over to Amanda Ahmadi, who is our moderator today. Amanda completed her PhD in architecture and Asian studies at the University of Melbourne in 2007. She also holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from Parayangan University in Bandung in Indonesia. Her Dissertation explores the role of architectural discourses within the 20th century construction of cultural identity in Bali. Amanda is interested in looking at the interactions between architecture and identity politics and how this unfolds in different historical periods, pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial area. Her main focus is the architectural landscape of Indonesia and Southeast Asian region. Her recent writings have been published in ABE Journal, Fabrications and Space and Polity, and Sir Bannister Fletcher's Global History of Architecture in 2019. She is one of the contributors to the forthcoming Encyclopedia of Vernacular Architecture of the World in 2022, edited by Marcel Wellinga. Currently, she is an associate professor at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning of the University of Melbourne in Australia. Amanda, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Eduard, for a very kind and generous introduction. I would like to first say thank you to um, the invitation to moderate this symposium, uh, and I'm really looking forward um, to really learn from our fantastic contributors tonight. I'm here in Melbourne, so it is tonight, but good morning, good afternoon, and good evening in case some of you are you know, closer to me here in Melbourne in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, thank you, Edward, for that summary of, of uh, the starting point of the symposium, uh, which is the exhibition um, uh, open earlier this week. Uh, Diplom in Engineer, Architect, German Trained Indonesian Architects from the 1960s. As an architect or as, as a child aspiring to become an architect, my, li my life in Jakarta, I grew up in the city surrounded by buildings designed by those architects that Edward mentioned um, in, in his introduction. So it is my, my privilege to, to be part of the symposium. Um, to not only kind of reflect on um, you know, the, the relationship between Indonesia and Germany, but primarily in terms of the amount of research, archival research um, that really kind of made that exhibition possible. As Eduard mentioned earlier, some of the materials exhibited have never seen before, and it's an outcome of a really rigorous exploration investigation uh, to locate those data. Um, we often think that buildings architecture speak for themselves, but the archival research works um, that made this exhibition and the future books possible reveal so much more complex history. And it's about connection between places beyond the building itself situated in Jakarta. This is about history of migrations history of cultural exchange. Um, so it is, um, I'm really excited that we're going to uh, listen from seven contributors tonight, uh, reflecting on the whole process of working with archival collections, how we build narrative, how we build knowledge and make that knowledge accessible, make history accessible to the wider public. Architecture and urban planning surround our life. Um, it is a reflection of society, but often very, very seldom they are discussed by the public themselves. They're always around us and sometimes they become really invisible backdrop. 
So I think it is important that, that we discuss tonight, um, you know, how we, 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 we access the story behind um, the place that surround us, uh, what makes it possible. Um, and it, it raised the question of how testimonies and knowledge from the past can be used to understand our present. And indeed, our historical understanding started with the question that we have about the present. What brings us to where we are today? Um, so it's, it, is, it is my uh, privilege to, to introduce uh, the seven contributions contributors tonight. Uh, so we will have uh, um, a combination of presentation and conversation. Um, the first uh, presentation is from um, Angeline Basuki, an architect and contributor to architecturindonesia.org. She is also a researcher um, and, and uh, contributing to Jakarta Old Town Consortium, um, and she is based in Jakarta. Um, our second contributor is Mr. Leonard Maui um, from Federal Foreign Office of Germany um, in, uh, in charge and cultural relations with Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific. I'm here in Australia, so I'm, I'm very excited to be part of the conversation and learn from uh, Mr. Maui directly. Um, and the third contribu contributor is Paul, Paul Spies who's the director of Stiftungstadt Museum Berlin or City Museum Berlin. Um, our fourth contributor is Setia Di Sopandi, um, 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 who's, who will present also on behalf of Afianti Arman. Um, and they are artistic, um, um, they are um, the key curators, uh, one of the member of the curator, cur curatorial team behind the exhibition Diplom Engineer Architect German Trained Indonesian Architects from 1960s. And then we have uh, Yo Santoso, Doctor Engineer, Urban Planner, Architect, Sociologist, and member of the advisory team on National Affordable Housing Program in Indonesia. And we'll, we'll also hear from uh, Suryono Herlambang, Senior Researcher, from Universitas Tarumanagara, Department of Architecture and Planning. Last but not least, we will also uh, hear from Laksmi Pamunchak, novelist, poet, journalist, and food writer who is based in Jakarta. So I would like to invite um, the first uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Angeline Basuki, um, who will present um, on the theme how do we follow the path of our protagonists? And we will have a, a roughly 20 minutes presentation uh, from Angeline. And then I would like to invite the audience to use the chat function if they, they have a question and we will try to accommodate as much as we can the questions that uh, um, arrive at, at the Q&A session at the end. Um, so we will have the seven contributors uh, presenting uh, their materials, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So I would like to invite Angeline um, to share her presentation. Yeah, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, uh, everyone. So, let me introduce myself. I am Angeline Basuki. You can call me Angie. I'm from Yayasan Museum Architecture Indonesia. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my fellow researchers here uh, in the Deeple Ing Architect Program. Um, this will be a sharing session of what we've been going through during the past eight months of preparations. Uh, we will talk about the a brief on the subject framework, uh, cataloging the archives, uh, and then the process of selecting the materials, the challenges, and how we present it uh, on the exhibition. So without further ado, um, how do we follow the paths of our protagonist 
so we started in the beginning uh, having extensive online meetings with the curators to discuss the framework, uh, which later literally reflected in the subtitle of our program, uh, German Train, Indonesian Architects in the 60s. Uh, these three boundaries uh, help us to have a list of the patterns we wanted to dig deeper. At least a dozen names popped up, uh, and we in Indonesia, we managed to explore half of them. The next thing we knew, we were knocking doors of the custodians and former colleagues, and we were more than lucky to be welcomed warmly by each of them. The researchers, uh, we were assigned into teams to focus on one patron, and then the inventory started. The first step was looking briefly on their biography. And at this stage, the opinions of those who are related to the patrons, the family and colleagues also help us to shape the patron's characters, uh, at least from our point of view. After briefly browsing through the archives, uh, we could have expectations on the volume of the archives, then we started to work on the catalog. Together, we used a shared Excel sheet uh, as the main database, both for physical and metadata. This platform is also useful for us checking each other process. <laughs> yeah. In general, uh, we implemented location based for the reference code. So building code slash room code slash container code uh, slash the number of the archives. Uh, other than that, uh, we also use color codes to cluster the archives into categories. Each pattern has very uh, significant character, but overall uh, the researcher's team, uh, we use four to six color codes for each person, uh, such as personal code, uh, academic projects, organizations, and so on. So in the process, uh, we also secured some secondary resources, uh, publications, books, magazines, newspaper. Some were written by our patrons. The others were written about them or their works. Uh, we acquired through purchasing, and interestingly, we also found articles were kept on each other's house. For example, uh, we found Mangon Wijaya's text at Swondo's house, or a newspaper article about Bian Pun's house at Han Awal's home. Um, and also our fellow researcher, Setiap Gedung Punya Cerita, they specialize in this with their hundreds of architectural publication collections. Uh, we were all uh, well fed with information. We also visited many buildings that were designed by the architects. And while we were doing the documentations, uh, sometimes we came across uh, more archives inside the buildings. So like, uh, for example, uh, this was when we visited Mangalawana Bhakti, which was designed by Suyudi's firm, Gubah Laras. We dig into their library and museum. Uh, then we found some construction reports and construction documentations inside. So, the next step after our catalogs were uh, ready or sort of ready, uh, we started selecting the archives. Uh, as the catalogs uh, were based on categories, for each category, we selected the most important and impactful materials of the patrons. When selecting the archives, uh, we chose different approaches, uh, such as the, to determine uh, from chronological milestones uh, and also based on 
hobbies or interests, academics, publication, and also personal matters. Uh, the other approach also choosing like one particular uh, period of time that is more representative. Uh, for example, uh, for Ham Awal's master plan and church category, uh, his 60s and 70s master plans were very modernist, while his 70s and 80s churches were very symbolic. And at this stage, uh, there are questions that came up uh, between a group of our researchers. Uh, the first one, does the archive majorly represent the topic, uh, which resulted in selecting series of drawings, photographs, of their teaching materials, and some of the tools that they use while working? Uh, second one, uh, does this archive intersect with any famous figure or important moment in the history? And this resulted in selecting records of them being mandated by the government or getting an important role in an institution. And lastly, the third one, does this archive represent any particular interests that haven't been known and can this archive portray the patrons as a more approachable relatable as a human figure so this included the the patrons personal collections uh, such as cameras family photographs personal writings about their colleagues or other mundane hobbies So during the preparation, uh, we face many challenges. In Han Awal's case, the biggest challenge was the huge amount of the archives. Uh, Adelia is also here who led the, <laughs> the research of Han Awal. So among them, uh, many of the archives were not uh, representative. So it was a bit difficult to determine which one could tell stories uh, the best. And on the other case, uh, the archives were already pre-selected. Uh, although it saved our time, but we were anxious if there was something else uh, important that we might miss. Uh, in this case, uh, the close relationship between the custodians and former colleagues resulted that they were actually sharing with each other as well about the process and sort of motivated each other to open more access to, to the archives for us researchers, researchers. So this was a great balancing uh, for each patron's role uh, on the exhibition. The other challenge uh, was some of the room condition was very dusty or the temperature was too warm. And some of the archives were still in random or scattered. So it took some time to put into categories. And the time also limited uh, for us to convert everything to metadata. So prioritization was already needed since the very beginning. And there were few archives that we couldn't uh, navigate the, the source, the credit and the date information. And we also find it hard to read handwritings and the language barriers also made us pretty hard to identify archives in Dutch and Deutsch. And well, luckily we have uh, Google Translate now. And the other challenge, uh, we took turns to get COVID <laughs> during the preparations. Uh, luckily it didn't stop us since the fellow researchers were always there to cover each other's role. 
So also before meeting vulnerable groups, uh, we took initiative to get a swap test. And in the archiving phase of Bian Pun and Ham Awal, for example, uh, the archives were stored in two or more locations. So the team couldn't work uh, for consecutive days since that would disturb the family's uh, routine and private life. So, uh, and we also face the location distance and schedule issues. Uh, some of us live far away or had our own daily routine. So we had to adjust our schedule over times in such a limited uh, period we had. Another challenge, uh, this one is the uh, one of the interesting challenge we had. So uh, reproducing old drawings, uh, their sizes were too large to fit the scanner that we had to, to take photographs. And the conditions uh, were, were varied one to each other. For example, the the hidden gem that we found at Bian Pun's home uh, was his diploma project. It was hidden on the back of their house. We didn't expect uh, we will find it uh, because the initially we went there only for uh, visiting the house since it was his first home in Jakarta. So. One of the sides of the diploma uh, were sticking into each other. So perhaps from the leaking of the building uh, that we had to separate them carefully uh, before taking the photographs of each page. And drawn by the archives and the stories uh, one of the hardest challenges was to stay objective. Um, especially, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, the majority of people tend to be drawn on the romanticization and nostalgia of the person, the patron, that might separate them from their significant works and leg legacies. And this is why it is important to always discuss with the curators since uh, they are looking from broader view. So building the narratives uh, with the very limited time and space that we have, uh, pre-existent knowledge uh, became important, uh, especially with the help of the former colleagues and family. Uh, we frequently ask them to validate our findings. And luckily, all of them were available most of the time and really helpful. And the custodians also proactively helped the researchers in archive selection and developing the narratives especially on the personal category. We look closer to the archives uh, to understand each strong characteristic in their works. Uh, then we started to stitch the archive clusters chronologically combined with categories. The strategy was to present the works, their legacies, while still maintaining human touch through personal belongings. It is also necessary to place limitation in the participatory archiving process with related custodians to secure objectiveness and unbiased knowledge produced from this process. The narratives then manifested into the display. Uh, we use Google Slides and Mural, among others, as our main communication tools with the designer team. Uh, we went back and forth working on the layout. And during the last week of the preparation, the designer team uh, assisted us on site to finalize the display together. And 
I would say that the hardest part was compromising and letting go a couple of selected materials. And uh, this is the situation just a day before the opening. So during the preparation of this exhibition, uh, we have witnessed the heartwarming process of family members and former colleagues tapping back into their memories of the patrons and also getting back in touch with family members of the fellow patrons. Uh, heads off to the patrons and the custodians. Uh, most of the archives are kept in good conditions, especially through the personal belongings. Uh, we could feel the the presence of them and even though we we didn't have a chance to to get to know most of them personally but we had a chance to read their thoughts on publications articles teaching materials look at the, their drawings and sketches um, experience their buildings and we think that these are the important legacies the spectrum of careers that architecture graduates could pursue. There are still a lot to tell about each of them. This exhibition is merely just a glimpse. Eight tables and a room are not enough to narrate decades of someone's life and career. With all the limitations and challenges that we face, we did our best to present this and we hope that we could continue to explore extended archives and more patrons. So, um, as I said before, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the researchers team. Uh, so now please turn on your camera and wave. Adelia, Tania, Bangkit, Fernicia, Jason, Hedista, Jesslyn, Nadira, Anissa, Trisha, and Lufia. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, giving it back to you, Amanda. Thank you, Angeline, for that fantastic um, sharing of, of, of the whole journey. Um, I think it's fascinating to see the richness of materials and the challenges. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to unpack further your reflection of the particular way you classify or the team classify and then um, organize um, the archive, thus building a particular narrative, as I'm pretty sure there are multiple narratives that can be told through this, uh, the vastness of the materials that, that um, the team have discovered. Um, I would like now to uh, move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Leonard Maui. Um, and um, this time we will have a conversation. Um, welcome, uh, Mr. Maui. Um, if you can um, uh, unmute yourself. Um, and the theme of the conversation is about what is the impact of cultural exchange? So Mr. Maui is from the Federal Foreign Office of Germany, as, as I introduced earlier, um, 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 leading the cultural relations of Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific. So uh, Mr. Maui, I would like to first start with um, going back to your conference um, in October and uh, to, to underscore that the Federal Foreign Office reclaims culture and and education as diplomatic tools. And at the conference in October, you used the slogan, let's talk culture um, and 70 years of culture exchange and beyond. Would, would you be able to elaborate the background in the shaping of that theme? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, first of all, let me say uh, good morning to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone in Jakarta, good evening. Uh, in Australia. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Um, and I also want to say congratulations to SBCA um, on 
on the opening of the exhibition on Monday. I heard um, it was it was a very good event. Um, also on the uh, catalog that's coming out, it looks great. So I'm very much looking forward to reading it. And I really also want to say congratulations to Angie and the team. Um, that looks like a lot of work went into it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's quite exciting. So um, thank you also for mentioning uh, our, our little conference in October, which we held simultaneously here in Berlin, as well as in Jakarta. That was actually one of the um, highlights of our joint anniversary agenda, uh, celebrating 70 years of diplomatic relations between Indonesia and Germany this year. And we very specifically decided to focus the conference on our cultural relations. Uh, why is that? Um, cultural diplomacy is, is one of our most important tools in our foreign policy. Um, Cultural policy is, or cultural diplomacy is what allows us to, to create and facilitate people-to-people uh, -people exchange. These very interpersonal exchanges um, that lead to intersocietal exchange. And this exchange in turn is, is really what allows us to build the foundations of trust between our societies to facilitate the exchange of ideas, of concepts, of different perspectives uh, and of knowledge. Um, and I think that's that's very fundamental for for our bilateral relations with other countries um, to create the basis for better understanding, which will help us to, to have peaceful relations, peaceful conflict resolution. But especially when we talk about knowledge exchange, it helps us to find common solutions to to problems that we jointly face. Um, so, again, I think. Cultural diplomacy is is one of our most fundamental tools in foreign policy. We are, sometimes talk about a model of three pillars, one being the political relations, the second being the economic relations, and the third being our cultural and education relations. But I think even more than that, it really kind of underlies all our foreign policy because you know it's a people-centered foreign policy, which is made by people for people. So um yeah, I think um, that's why we chose to focus this conference and actually the entire anniversary agenda on our people to people exchange. Thank you. Um, and just to kind of um, uh, returning to the exhibition itself, Diploma Engineer Architect Project, um, what interests you the most about this theme and, and um, why did the um, you know FFO Federal Foreign Office decided to to support this program. Well, I think it's a very great example of what I was just talking about um, by uncovering these past linkages between our countries, these histories, very interesting histories of of Indonesian architect uh, architecture students coming to Germany in the sixties, being exposed to to different ideas and perspectives here, leaving their mark in Germany, but then also taking these new ideas back to Indonesia. It really, um, yeah, it really showcases how um, academic exchange and, and, and cultural exchange can shape our bilateral relations. And um, I think it's important that we make this known to more people, to an interested public in both our countries. But I think it's also a great way to to invite discourse on post-colonial architecture um, and to to reactivate and incentivize these uh, networks of knowledge exchange. Um, so not just looking back at the past, but but talking about today and the future. Um, so I think this symposium is a great example of exactly that us coming together here talking about these issues. It's it's a great great feature of this project and we were very happy to to fund it. Yeah, and I think this is really, really fascinating. The fact that I can already see um, the amount of resources that this multi-years initiative that Sally and, and her team has, has uh, developed, it will be an important source of teaching the next generation of architects. And, um, and I only you know, already shared the, uh, the the website with my colleague in Australia, who's you know keen on expanding their knowledge about Southeast Asia. And I think uh, I would like to emphasize the fact that um, this project reveal 
um, layers of history of Indonesian architecture that is previously unseen, this, this other connection. Often Indonesia is directly kind of um, um, understood through the, the period of colonialism. Um, and, and here in Australia, our, uh, Australia is pretty much focused on the influence of uh, British uh, Britain and, uh, and the Commonwealth and colonialism. And, and in fact, that um, uh, the whole uh, exposition about Southeast Asian modernism, we encounter this migration of ideas and cultural exchange that are much more complex than you know, the, the, the so-called metropole and colonial relations. You know, this is across borders. So I think that's, um, um, is a really valuable knowledge building, um, the exercise that I've seen through uh, the project. Um, my next question is, um, what do you see as, um, which instruments are part of, um, um, uh, uh, the, uh, which instruments are part of the cultural exchange moving forwards? How do we uh, facilitate further cultural, cultural exchanges? <laughs> Well, we actually have a very, very broad toolbox um, that we we can deploy for our cultural exchange. And it's actually broadening because our understanding of culture has also been broadening. You know, it, it used to be maybe that we would mostly fund a concert tour or um, theater exchange. And that still happens, of course. But I think we, we've really broadened our conception of of culture exchange to include more innovative formats as well. Gaming being an example that has really come uh, to the forefront recently. Um, digital offers, um, design, architecture, what we're talking about now. Um, we've really broadened our concept of culture to reach a more diverse set of people and sliver of society. Um, but it's much more than that. We, we have youth exchange platforms, uh, city partnerships, the partnership between Berlin and Jakarta being a, a very prominent example, um, but also religious dialogue formats, uh, sports, um, of course, uh, cultural preservation projects, um, very important aspect. Um, but then of course you have the entire um, academic exchange area where we fund scholarships, uh, scientific exchange opportunities for um, scholars, for scientists, uh, and media, another very important area. So it's a very, very broad um, yeah, set of, of tools that we can deploy. And we mostly do it through our implementing partners, the Goethe Institute probably being the most most well-known and famous, but also the German Academic Exchange Service, um, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and many more, um, our network of schools, um, German schools abroad, but also those schools that teach German uh, as a foreign language. So yeah, it's a very um, wide set of, uh, of tools and partners. And again, we try to reach as many people as possible and really kind of broaden this idea of what cultural exchange trying to reach more and more people. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and here in Melbourne, you know, my son went to Deutsche Schule in Melbourne and I think education is pretty much a very important platform, you know, Absolutely. level you know, primary school, high school, and also university. And I think the collaboration between um, um, uh, education institution is very important medium of cultural exchange. Um, my next question, and perhaps the last questions, I'm just mindful of the time, focusing on Germany and Indonesia, where, um, where is the, what will be the next chapters in terms of the relationship between the two countries? And, and what do you see the role of architecture and urban development in that context? Right, so I think there's no question that um, Indonesia is becoming more and more of a very important partner for us in, in Germany. Um, not just Indonesia, but the entire region. I say on the Indo-Pacific, we recently published our new policy guidelines um, for the Indo-Pacific region, and it makes very clear how important uh, the region is becoming for us, not just in, you know, on an 
economic sense, obviously, there is a lot of economic opportunities for, you know, how do we design fair trade between our countries? How do we um, manage the digitization and all that? Um, but also when we talk about mm, defending the the multilateral um, rules-based world order, not well, coincidentally, this year, both Indonesia and Germany held um, the presidencies of G7 and G G20, um, respectively. Um, and I think we we work together very well on on these issues of uh, maintaining uh, the rules based international order. Um, but and then we also have very important challenges that we face together, most importantly, probably being climate change. Um, but then also pandemic preparedness was obviously a huge issue over the last couple of years. Um, so I think it's we're working more and more um, in sync and it's it, Indonesia is just becoming an ever more important partner for us. Um, but on top of that, um, I think what I mentioned before, What's really also very important for us is to see how do we create more people to people exchange. And I think that's where, you know, architecture, urban development, that also comes into play. Uh, I, I was just talking about climate change when we, um, I think an efficient knowledge exchange on, on, um, when we talk about smart urban planning, that's really how we can contribute to solutions for for the challenges associated with climate change in, in these rapid urbanization processes. And we can really learn from each other and, and advance on these challenges when we work together. So um, I think it plays a very important role going, uh, looking ahead to the future. And uh, we definitely do wanna continue strengthening these, these knowledge exchange platforms. Thank you, Mr. Maui. And I think, yes, this 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 idea of how to how do we deal with climate emergency? And, and I think there's there's really kind of a space open in front of us to think about what makes a res resilient city and how do we trans and at the end of it, cities are are built are consist of, of buildings and 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 um, urban forms. And I think the uh, the type of architecture we build in the future pretty much determine. Um, you know, how resilient is our future. Um, Absolutely. And so, yes, um, so thank you very much uh, for this conversation and, um, um, and we really uh, appreciate your time and, um, and your support in, in making um, this series of events uh, possible. It's a pleasure, thank you so much. Now, I would like to um, um, invite our next uh, contributors. Um, it was my pleasure to welcome my friend. Uh, we studied together um, in, uh, some years ago in, in, in the architecture school in Bandung. Um, and we spent uh, even time studying under Pak Han Awal during our inter internship um, semester. Um, so, and I'm really excited to, to learn from Satya Di Sopandi about um, his latest endeavor um, in creating an, um, a platform, an online platform for archive. Um, how can online archives contribute to the production of architectural history? A very timely topic. Over to you, Satya Di. All right, thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mandy, for the kind introduction. Yes, it's so nice to meet you and everyone here. And uh, I'm trying to share my screen. All right. So greetings, everyone. Wonderful, wonderful talk so far. I hope my part will contribute as such. As Sally and Edward mentioned at the introduction together, we are currently hosting our second collaboration in SEAM Encounters in the exhibition, uh, Diplom in Architect in Jakarta, opened last Monday and will be on display until uh, January 12th uh, next year. In this presentation, I will address the question, how can online archives contribute to communication of architectural history? With our first-hand experience for the past few years, 
Uh, I'm actually representing a, a group. Uh, we are part of an initiative called Yayasan Museum Architecture Indonesia, or literally means the Indonesian Architecture Museum Foundation, or better known as architectureindonesia.org. In this occasion, we'd like to take the opportunity to describe what it is, how it operates, why we do it, and what it will become. So to understand how it directly is directly linked to the why in the first place, architectureindonesia.org was established by Nadia Prostri, Febrianti Suryaningsi, Aviati Arman, and myself in 2017 as a website, which served as an online repository for anything related to architectural activities, design, construction, architectural discourse in Indonesia. So it's very ded dedicated uh, in a specific topic. Recently, Indonesia embarks on a massive infrastructural development throughout its territory, unprecedented in scale and scope. Architects and architectural services become essential and strategic in providing good services, not only for a certain member of the society, but also for general public. We often get to see mixed reaction by the general public regarding, in example, uh, the exposed plans of Indonesian new capital or controversial infrastructural development in restricted heritage areas and things like that. So the growing needs for architectural services are not automatically and fairly balanced by access to get information regarding our architectural productions and knowledge, let alone architectural criticism, the lack of common understanding about the history, the development and the options available for users and general public are often overlooked. But now more than ever, the public is growing aware of the need of a good, safe, proper, friendly, and democratic facilities, as well as environmentally, socially, and culturally sound projects. So to support such awareness to the public, we thought that we can actually play a role, which is to provide the substantial basic knowledge, such as our own urban architectural and infrastructural development history. We think that the public should be made familiar with the histories of our own built environment, building traditions, acquired technologies, resources we use, and professional institutions. It's eventually becoming a necessity with the growing number of research-based postgraduate programs in Indonesian architectural schools, where students develop theses on topics relevant not only to the profession and the discipline, but also to cultural and political discourse. As much as this is a general concern, this was a long answered, unanswered demand for myself who had difficulties in developing working research topic for my undergraduate and postgraduate studies due to the lack of information. Until recently, if we embark in an architectural research about Indonesia, we need to provide enormous extra effort just to gain access to, to information such as historic map, photographs, drawings, and simple as particular information. Or we often ended up producing the information as our study project. While on the other hand, since 1990, Dutch authors with their meticulous research on well-preserved architectural archival materials continue producing interesting monographs about architecture in Indonesia. Publications on Indonesian architecture were once dominated by material from such monographs, and this shows the apparent disparity of knowledge production. This trend is good, but it's alarming for Indonesia because we are not contributing to this. So in uh, in my own experience in 2013, we were greatly challenged during our first national participation in the 14th International Architecture Exhibition in uh, La Biennale de Venezia. The curator call to all national participants posed by Rem Pohas, the head curator at the time, was to respond with an interesting and important topic within a hundred years of respective uh, nations' architectural history. With a very limited archival resources, we had to come up with a rather generic working title, which enabled us to avoid relying too much on archival material and written sources. This turned out to be a moment of reflection for us when we were there and found some countries like Netherlands, Japan, Korea, and the United States were able to bring out interesting historical threads, intriguing issues based on their recollection of archival materials. Apart from being an international showcase, our curatorial team at the time, craftsmanship, material consciousness becomes a call for Indonesia to look inside on the potential as well as exposing our own underbelly. The heart of the problem was obviously the lacking of public archival institutions. If they exist, none of them provide easy access to the materials. 
And ironically, we were often ended up back with abandoned material from Dutch resources, mostly colonial, which is considerably older than national resources from the recent and post-colonial periods. As much as I'm grateful for the Dutch resources providing fresh information about architecture in Indonesia, I'm actually tired of being fed with the secondhand information unable to produce our own materials. Apart from my personal frustration, it can be downright problematic. We, we might grow love and care for colonial artifacts more than our own national cultural heritage. Or it can be the other way around. We grow an ultra-nationalistic sentiment despising non-Indonesian articles and blindly develop preferences for everything labeled as local and national without truly understand what they all means. But they are more into this rather than binary opposition, of course. If you look closer into cultural and technical aspects of architectural production, we often see a wide spectrum of creating uh, creative forces as well as pragmatic considerations, influences, and also connections. Despite the growing uh, attention to and uh, about the documentation of local architectural knowledge, there were only peripheral attempts to build an architectural archival institution for so many years. In the 1980s, the Indonesian Architects uh, Association hoped to establish one, but failed to do so. But finally, in the early 2000s, in response to pressure from architectural conservation projects, a handful of renowned architects established Pusat Dokumentasi Arsitektur, or PDA, in 2002, a center for architecture documentation. Under the directorship of Nadia Prorosti and Fabian Tisuriyaningsi, our, our colleagues, PDA grew as a unique, important, and pivotal institution providing not only documentation services uh, for conservation efforts, but also pioneering a tradition and standard for dealing with historical material for both practical and scholarly purposes. Uh, PDA's works in two decades cover a vast range of architectural monuments in Indonesia, producing uh, conservation assessment techniques and manuals, even guides for architectural archival research, extensive inventory of fortification, uh, historic urban landscape, uh, publication, and, and strategic linking with uh, Dutch and Indonesian agencies. So they, they did quite a lot uh, on that. But another game changer came when an international network called Modern Asian Architecture Network, or MAN, initiated a series of academic workshops in Indonesia, collaborating dozens of architectural students, lecturers, and architects across borders to join research workshops in one of the most important figures in, Indonesian, in modern Indonesian architecture, Friedrich Silaban. A week of intensive inventory and writing workshop uh, produced a collaborative publication on Silaban's own house with wash built uh, between 1959 and 1960. And the publication triggered several other collaborative inventory workshops by students, which led to establish a Silaban archive, enabled us to publish the biography of Silaban by 2017, and follow an exhibition later uh, that year. So it kind of like a snowballing event. This effort brings out the focus closer to modern post-independence architectural research. The network itself uh, transformed into a focused collaborative project on Southeast Asian modernist architecture, established as Masayana project, bring together scholars from Japan, Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, and Indonesia together, and produce several events and publications as outputs. So it has been very, very productive for, for all of us. A few years be between 2014 and 2018, we had several wonderful opportunities as well, including to explore several architecture museum and archival institution in several countries throughout the directory from the International Confederation of Architecture Museum and Personal Collection Connections, uh, such as the Deutsches Architecture Museum in Frankfurt, Archie Depot and National Archive of Modern Architecture in Tokyo, Every Art and Architecture Library at Columbia University, and so on and so on. There's a lot of uh, things that we find interesting and attractive for us to choose from. This extensive of leash, uh, uh, archive and museums show a spectrum of their interests, orientations, collections, range of medias, and context about how they run the institutions. Some remain within the country state boundary, probably like us. Some limit to particular historical period, also like us. Some try to claim global, global coverage on 20th uh, uh, century and contemporary architecture, which is not us. Many dedicate their collection on particular architects or medium 
and whilst uh, dedicate themselves toward educating the general public. This exposures guide us to the formation of architecture Indonesia.org in 2017, which initially focused on modern Indonesian architecture and architects during the early period of Indonesian independence. We aim to acquire as much as information as possible to the actors, events and projects built and also unbuilt on critical national building periods between 1945 until the early 1960s, and also the construction boom of the 1970s, 1980s, and also the recent development after 1998 economic crisis. So Negro include architectural practices throughout Indonesia, which can include traditional and vernacular practices, government programs, large scale uh, urban planning, scholarly work in the form of books and articles. However, due some to the, our limitation, the fact that we don't, we don't, know, don't have a governmental or private patronage, we strictly started as online repository, as a web archive service to, uh, for all to access. Um, with the help from sponsors and individual donations, we established a, a museum foundation with the hope that someday we can grow and become a real physical museum. But to, uh, to establish a digital and online museum is not cheap, actually. To digitize uh, physical materials is a costly effort, which requires equipments and expertise. It's not simply a slide a piece of paper into a scanning machine, but sometimes it requires the total restoration of damaged material. Some drawings are just too shiny to photograph or too delicate to open. We often stumble for many hours just to understand a small piece of paper and uh, whether we should scan it or just let it be. Many of the established archival institutions are not even considering digitalization in their agenda exactly because of these issues. However, we went ahead with it. We thought that this is the only way to go forward because we need to have a presence in Indonesia as well in the international scene. And we also want to cover our ground, uh, the Indonesian architectural history of the 20th century with firm stepping stone before we can cover wide, wider pages, build the mounds of narratives and dig deeper into specific issues. We began our digital collection with several acquisitions, including the archive of uh, uh, dominated by Frederick Silaban archive, Roma Asu, Andra Martin, Indonesian Young Architects, and our collection have grown considerably since along with our public outputs. Uh, to survive and grow with six funding opportunities for governmental grants, as well as commissions, corporations, and sponsorships to do research-based publication and exhibition projects. Occasionally, we had talk series on specific fresh architectural topics. These activities were not only providing us funding to go ahead, but also enable us to disseminate our research and collection to wider audience from professional and educational circles to media, government officials, quite important and general public. Uh, within the first five years, we produced three major printed publications and four physical exhibitions, which, which we consider very, very important until now, and dozens of online editor, editorial surf, uh, articles we put online on, on our website. And uh, we produce, sorry, we produce uh, in 2017, uh, uh, extended biography of uh, the architect uh, Friedrich Silaban, and soon followed by exhibition. And con by concentrating on the figure like the Silaban, we cover important tradition transitional period where a small number of Indonesian architects emerged among the uh, Dutch architects and engineers, with, which dominated at the time, and during the late colonial period and early independence period. Silaban is the icon of the early independence when he was entrusted by the Indonesia first president uh, to design major institutional buildings between in 59 until 1965. Uh, this production were a long time coming for Indonesian architectural history since he is probably the single most, single most influential and renowned architect in the 50s and 60s. By doing so, we managed to fill, fill up a huge gap in the history of modern architecture in Indonesia and gave way for other influential figures to come to the light. And between 2018 to 2020, we hosted the fourth Nasayana Conference in Jakarta and published two books on Gora Bung Karno, Indonesia's Asian Games Sports Complex, which was originally built for the 1962 Fourth Asian Games, uh, which went through major refurbishment in 2018 for the 18 Asian Games. So it's just uh, right for the, for the moment at the time. 
Our collection collection also grew, it acquired contemporary archival materials from renowned practices in Indonesia and other kinds of architectural activities such as exhibition and workshops. During the pandemic, we got quite busy. We did two exhibition projects during 2020 and 2021. Our co good collaboration with Siam Encounters is a very interesting project because it's enabled us to explore a bit beyond architectural standpoint and to express it artistically. In this project, we also learn on how fellows from Germany and Southeast Asian countries express their takes on their own architectural, modern architectural heritage. Our contribution is to this to the discussion is to frame modern architecture as an imposition, something that dictates, dominates, narrates not only public spaces, but also domestic environment. And also something rather alien to most of Indonesian, especially during the 1950s and 60s. Modern spaces are composed aesthetically, roll out visual noises, demanding the environment to be well taught, designed and maintained. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, most of uh, architectural projects in the 60s are state commission produce monumental structures, especially in the capital of Jakarta, uh, to, be, to, 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 to be a symbol of, of freedom for the colonial background, imposing new nationalist values such as modernism, internationalism, and national unity. However, despite uh, the injected values and imposing rules of, on the modern, modern uh, monumental modern architectural icons of Jakarta, we observe that these values change over time, meanings eroded and replaced by new ones. Multiple agents actively altering the way we perceive and use the space. So therefore we propose an exhibition that to show that uh, and, and express the extent of how Indonesian in general public, people in the streets, passers-by, street hawkers, children, perceive and occupy modern architectural spaces. We selected Kopi, Kopi Manyar Cafe, which is a very famous one in Indonesia because it was designed and owned by Indonesia, probably the most uh, uh, the most famous Indonesian architect at the time. At this time, uh, we, we select the cafe for the venue because of popularity among design communities and trendy young people. And the renovated old building features slick, clean, modernist, intimate space by Andra Martin, which seems dictating the way we occupy the space, even the 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 cafe goers are wearing black like architects. Functioning also a gallery space, it has been featuring architecture, photography, art exhibition uh, with the same aesthetic breadth. So we, we did a briefly violated that image by occupying the space with a casual, relaxed, nonchalant, almost ignorant attitude as a demonstration of a prevailing gap between design modernist spaces and relaxed everyday life. We also feature artworks by renowned figures in arts, journalists, artists, essays, Gunawan Muhammad, artist designer Cecil Mariani, product designer uh, Alvin Citro Wirio, essays and art critic Hikmat Darmawan produced their own artistic uh, impression of the of the eight Indonesian modernist architectural pieces. So they, they respond to that with the artworks. Another opportunity to cover a recent historical period came when we acquired the archive of a group of Indonesian young architects who called themselves rather creatively Indonesian young architects. This is a loosely associated group create, uh, centered on two figures, Irianto Purnomo Hadi and Yori Antar, the son of Hanawal, which were joined by other now renowned names in architectural circles, such as Andrea Martin, Sony Susanto, Ahmad Ariana, and others. So since 1989, they set up as a frequent after hours gathering to share and discuss their own works, issues surrounding what's new in architecture. The group eventually grew, attracting more people, mostly students, gathered, eff uh, gathered effort to launch exhibitions and put themselves a limelight of uh, printed publication, which was not the norm at the time. The year 2020 marks the three decades of the from the first day appear in the as a, in the exhibition as a group uh, of uh, a group of young and non-experienced architects, which were end up as the most important figures in the architectural scene today. Their gathering and sharing activities set a new tradition and collegial connections um, uh, for younger generation of Indonesia to follow. So the yeah, so we may yes if you could conclude. Uh, yes, please. Yes, yes. Okay. So the last slide is actually one of the uh, last uh, 
pandemic project commissioned by PT Pangulong Jaya for the 70th year's anniversary as leading figure a partner and enterprise which has been playing a pivotal role in the development of Jakarta since the 1960s. So we cover not only architectural uh, research and, and, and archive, but also we deal with how uh, we expand to, to, to also cover infrastructural development of the city of Indonesia. So uh, we hope that this presentation that can give the audience a good glimpse and understanding of our organization uh, intentions and how we can contribute in communicating architectural history in Indonesia. That's all for now. Thank you. Back to Mandy. Thank you, Sutiadi. I think that's that's amazing reflection of, and I I just kind of realized how lucky if uh, for students of architecture today in in Jakarta and Indonesia because uh, you and uh, your colleagues have made have made history much more accessible through through your works, and and I think um, digitization of archive. Is crucial these days because it's what makes um, those collections searchable and discoverable. Um, and I think at that point, I think this is a very perfect transition to our next um, speaker, uh, Mr. Paul Spees. Um, I would like to wel welcome uh, Paul, who is the director of Stiftung Stadt Museum Berlin. Um, Paul Spees is an art historian and archaeologist of the ancient world. In 2009, he became a director of the Amsterdam Museum Foundation, where he oversaw the city museums. In 2016, he became the director of Stiftung Stadt Museum Berlin and the chief curator of the Federal State of Berlin at the Humboldt Forum. Welcome, Paul, and I look forward uh, to learn from the topic, how can we make archives speak? Over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, good morning to you all. I'm honored to speak to you. Very interested in Indonesia and architecture, although I'm not a specialist and I wasn't asked to be speaking about um, Indonesian architecture or um, and anything that has to do with the content, but I was asked to talk a little bit about new ways to make exhibitions attractive. Now, if you talk about making exhibitions attractive, you also always have to keep in, keep in mind to whom do you want to make it attractive. Um, so if it's about the architectural um, world, people that are involved, people that know, you make a slightly different exhibition than if you want to refer to a broader audience. And what I did understand from what you would plan, would like to plan for a future um, presentation, like uh, Leonard Mauer also um, explained, um, the broader audience uh, would could be a, a focus, could be a scope. And I think that, that this subject really, um, well, deserves a broad audience. Now, how do you get to a broader audience? Um, I would like to explain to you a few methods we tried out, um, mostly in the so-called Humboldt Forum, a disputed building, a reconstructed palace in the center of Berlin, um, where we and me as a chief curator made an exhibition on the world history of Berlin. So on the international connections of Berlin within the city and in the whole of the world. The exhibition has been um, organized by um, the museum in, uh, com you know, in cooperation with a state Bureau on uh, exhibition making. And um, we are, so to say, in the Humboldt Forum, but we're not the Humboldt Forum. We stay the Stadtmuseum making his own exhibitions for a specific goal group. And we chose young people. And this you will see in this presentation. This presentation um, might be um, a bridge too far in many. Re, uh, respects because we had a big budget, we had a lot of time, and we were um, able to invest in everything new that we could think of. Now, I don't want you to compare what you're going to do exactly with what we did. I just want to talk about some methods to be attractive to mostly young people. 
But let me introduce first, and maybe Erwin, you can open the first um, slide. Um, let me first introduce the museum, which stands behind that exhibition in the Humboldt Forum and the new developments that we have tried out in that exhibition. Um, so I'm director of a group of museums, the City Museum Berlin, and now you can show the next slide. Um, the uh, exhibition, uh, the, sorry, the museum in Berlin consists of many different buildings. Um, the left top, you can see part of the exhibition in the Humboldt Forum I mentioned, but also we have five other uh, locations. One is the oldest church of the city, the Nikolai Church, right top, left bottom. We have a period style uh, reconstruction Biedermeier house in the city center next to the church. That's left uh, bottom, right bottom, you can see our exhibition um, or special exhibition um, building, which is called the Ephraim Palais. Um, next slide, please. It goes on. We have an open air museum on the Middle Ages, which a lot with a lot of um, reenactment of the Middle Ages. In the southwest of the city, it's called Museumsdorf Düppel. And then we have um, our core house, um, which is on the right top, uh, which is the Märkisches Museum, a very difficult name for the city museum, this city history museum of Berlin, um, built in 1908 by the city architect Hoffmann, especially for this goal. And because it was built for the goal as being the city history museum, it is the first in world history because city history museums always get things like old abbeys to work in, etc., etc. So that building is going to be renovated now. It's from 1908 and it needs uh, a lot of improvement um, and that will start next year. And we are developing new plans, new ideas, which I will also share a little bit with you in my speech for uh, a reopening in probably 2028, together with this um, building. And you can see the shade of the tower on uh, that new building. There will be a second building in connection to the Märkisches Museum that will open in 2026, we hope. And it's now called the Marine House. Um, it was part of um, a Marine headquarters in the uh, capital of Berlin. Um, of course, they had their um, their uh, harbors not in um, in Berlin, but they had headquarters because it was the political center. The building you see was the official ballroom building, but we will change all of the interior to have a very new concept for museology, which is um, covering all arts, even um, drama and music, but also gastronomy to um, make people participate in storytelling uh, of the city. Can I have the next slide? Now, as you can see at this picture, um, the exhibition in the Humboldt Forum called Berlin Global tries to attract totally different people than we normally have in our old buildings. We were free to um, use uh, 4,500 square meters, 11 big rooms, to fill in with a new concept for a goal group that is not so often very interested in visiting museums or exhibitions. Um, we, have, we have been successful. The exhibition is open for one and a half years now. And um, we have a much larger group of young people visiting this. And um, the way it um, is, become, is known to these young people is by social media. They sent each other to this place and they visit it in their own way. And we've tried to interpret what their way is. And we've tried out many aspects which we uh, have developed as a sort of, um, as a sort of uh, pilot. And many of them um, are really successful for this goal group. Can I have this next slide? Um, if you want to make an exhibition for millennials, for the younger generations, you simply have to involve them in participating. You cannot just talk top down. You really have to ask them for their opinion, for the way they think about um, all kinds of aspects that you refer to. 
they should be part of the exhibition. Now, if you have budget, you can also try to do that technology with technology. As you can see, people get a wristband with a chip in it, and you can log in at these login stations in the first room. There you answer your first dilemma question. Dilemmas are good because dilemmas is not top down. Dilemmas is giving people the possible possibility to choose for an opinion. And because it's difficult to step into a subject matter, you prepare the dilemma questions. Can I have the next slide? As you can see, we have two doors between every room. This is a coincidence. I didn't need two room, uh, doors, I thought, at the beginning, but it helped us to come up with a sort of game in the exhibition. Now, what that means to you is um, to you, that, because you cannot copy exactly. You have to think of other ways, which are may, maybe more um, in line with the subject that you are going to present. But because we were involved with the internationality of Berlin, with the international position of Berlin, we asked people for questions on local and global, for instance. And this is the question that is put uh, for them um, before they go into the next room. If the shit hits the van, what will you do? Do you care about the world or do you care about your community? Of course, both is true. And that's a dilemma. So what says 50.1% in yourself um, if it is going to happen? What are you going to do? Are you going to stay and help your community or are you, go, are you going into the world and help more worldwide? Um, people choose, young people choose very, very quick. People like me, I'm 62, they stand there for an age and they don't know what to do. And then they go through the door, they hear their sound, everybody becomes his own interactive interactivity sound so that you're remembered that it is you who is active. Maybe you forgot, then you can go back and you can choose again. So we stand there for at least three minutes, are very irritated about the question, and then we choose. Um, young people just do it because it's gaming. Next level, you have to be quick. By the way, they go quick through exhibitions anyway. Don't expect young people to stay long, to read enormous texts, texts. and it's not a problem. It's not um, uh, shallow, it's not superficial. They know a lot about a lot. I know a lot about little. And it's a completely new generation that really is surfing everything in the world, online, offline. And that means that if everything is there, you have to be everywhere, everywhere because you can be everywhere. So you move, you move quickly, like fishes, you go through the exhibition. Me, people like uh, me, um, from an academic uh, background, we go through exhibitions like ants. We go slowly and we consume everything. And in any exhibition, there is an offer, which means that you can at least stay for four hours if you do the full content with four and a half thousand square meters. That's, of course, logical. But young people go by in a different way. And you have to see how you can make a mainstream exhibition in the middle and more in-depth information, which is recognizable. Can I have the next picture? Um, but also you have to have fun in the exhibition. This is the most extreme element in an exhibition that is very critical on the international position of Berlin in the history of Berlin and in the present. It is on things like um, colonialism. It's about post-colonialism. It's about racism. It's about all kinds of problems with um, freedom and um, oh, and 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 um, bordering out. Um, at least one moment you should you know be relaxed and you know get everything off your shoulders and and re and and do something with um, your physics so that you can go on for the next half of the exhibition. In the middle of Berlin Global, there is a disco ball in which you can go and you will get. Um, an, an overview of international dancing music, um, which you can, you, know, you can't hold still your feet, I assure you. Um, it's also a message, a message if you are internationally 
um, connected. Um, you don't have to speak languages. You can also dance together. Um, dancing is an international language. So it's not just superficial. It's also well thought out. It's conceptual. Can I have the next um, slide? And of course, there is a lot of content to be told, told. And of course, you know, you can do that by having endless texts on the walls. You can also show enormous amounts of documents and the young people will just skip it. They don't do it. They are not interested. Yes, a few, but most of them want to do something which has to do with choice, a free choice. And they also want to go through all kinds of programming in a quick way. They understand very quickly because they're trained to understand very quickly if it's online, if it's, it's, if, it's, um, if it's seen on screens, if you can do it interactively. This is a room where we talk about borders, um, borders from the past, like the Berlin Wall, but mostly on borders in the present, uh, inclusiveness or exclusiveness, illegalization or um, discrimination, all kinds of borders that we still have are um, told on screens and you can go through them and choose them. You can stop when you want, you can go on when you want. Um, and um, many people do a lot of these aspects on the screens and many young people just skip through it and understand. If you get the message uh, um, abroad, if you get the message along, that is mostly um, uh, satisfying because it's about a message. It's not about knowing everything. An exhibition is not a book. You can have the next picture. Of course, new media and interactive uh, formats work very well for architecture that will be of great importance. Um, again, the free choice to go through um, stories. You can make storylines in which you, for instance, make short, um, um, serials of pictures, like four at a time, which you can um, look as a short storyline. So um, with four sentences and four pictures, you, you pick out an aspect which you might be, or you might find interesting for the audience. And then they go through that and um, maybe you can do the rest at home because of course there's a lot of interactivity possible um, on websites or on, um, um, on um, uh, archives that are online. Can I have the next picture? Hands-on. Um, I saw so many beautiful pictures of research you did on these um, objects from architecture, architectures from their homes, um, bringing it to archives and then work on it um, by hand. Now, I understand that you cannot do that um, with a normal visitor because it's archives, it's historical material. Is it? Is there no possibility that people can help out? Is there no possibility in which they can copy the work you're doing? Because uh, I find that very attractive. I find the research phase of what you found a lovely and very interesting aspect. It has a sort, sort of romantism in it. Um, I think... Um, um, it, it was also mentioned, I think it was Amanda who said, we had to be careful not to be too nostalgic. But nostalgia is also a, a way to get people involved because it's feeling. And we're living in a, in a period in which um, we're no longer just rationally um, involved with, uh, with culture. Um, we're also emotionally involved uh, with culture, identity, um, etc. Um, so uh, maybe um, we have to uh, sometimes leave behind our very, very strict um, uh, Bauhaus architecture feeling to go towards the people, have the people um, participate. And I've seen in the last picture that was, was shown by Mr. Sapandi that already things happened in the last few years. Um, I would say just go on with that and, and develop that further. Can I have the next picture? Um, connect with your guests. Um, we have connectors in the exhibition, people that help out with techniques, but also who connect people with each other, but also start discussions. If you can manage, have students or other people that are interested communicate with the audience because they know they want to tell and uh, they want to tell each other. We also want to discuss 
material because if we do something we hope that people become active with that material that we've shown that you can also have famous people like on the left hand side a famous german or berlin um um rap uh, rapper has told some texts in our audience guides uh, or um, audit or audit guides um, and and uh, he, he's in, he's attractive in the way he t t tells about things, and he, he's one of the people. So um, it's not a classical uh, um, uh, expert that's talking, but he knows. He knows a lot. He's very interested in his city. He knows about his own background. He knows about his roots, and maybe some things are uh, very personal. But that makes exhibitions very um, interesting. If you can interview architects, still, if some of them live. Um, let them talk, show them as they talk, but also have young people uh, experience uh, sites of, made by architects and um, let them talk about their feeling uh, within uh, when they are at these sites. Can I have the next one? Um, enable connections, try to have people talk to each other. We have this game and the game ends in a discussion and the discussion is between people that don't know each other and they make connections, which um, is of course the meaning of the exhibition Berlin Global, connect globally, please. And we can, because the building is situated in the center of the city where the tourists come, many tourists come and they can connect each other. Can I have the next picture? Um, and of course, Try also to have um, communities talk with you, for you. Let the communities talk for themselves. Have people that live in those buildings or work in those buildings that you um, that have been made by these architects. Let them tell about their experiences with the architecture as users. Um, um, as, as, and then if you give over, if they want to tell, they yes, you can see here, this is the Sinti Roma group uh, telling about their connection with the city. And, 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 and they do it in their own way. And that is also very sympathetic. Although they use, a, they use a lot of text again, but they only have a small place. So let them tell a lot um, in a small place um, because it's, um, it's, it, it's in itself a unit. Um, everybody understands that we break out of our general atmosphere and give the floor to people that have a certain thing to say. I can have the next picture. Um, skip this one. Next one, please. Um, Co-creating. Um, I've been talking about it um, already. Um, um, have communities and, 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 and all kinds of um, uh, groups uh, be involved uh, so that they can still tell their story on your subject and, and, and use them um, as uh, emancipated uh, visitors and not as students or as schoolgoers can have the next picture it goes on we have to um as i said um create new um atmospheres new presentations in the Merkish museum and um the uh marina house um of course we're working with the university with students with young people that bring together their age but also their knowledge and their new creativity um, make it a mix of what you know and what young people develop for you, interpreting the subject matter that you bring. Can I have the next one? Next one again, this is the Merkish Museum. Please, next slide. Um, this is the inside of the Marine House. Um, there will be a city lab there. The city lab um, will be part of a building, as I said, with a lot of um, cross-culture and cross-creative art but also a city lab in which people can be involved to be participating maybe as members of the city lab um, so that um, they will be the ones who um, uh, organize the content um, and that present the content and that enlarge the content, but also manage their own lab laboratory of city history. Of course, you have to, um, you have to be guidance, you have to um, enable them. Um, and of course that will, Take you some time, but at least a lot is happening um, with the uh, energy that uh, comes free because of the participatory um, uh, way of working with people. Can I have the last slide, I believe? This is the, the listing of what I've been talking about. Animate history, tell stories and involve visitors in the storyline. Activate visitors, build challenges and create immersive spaces. Make presentations interactive, use new media. 
enable hands-on experiences, connect with guests and build on the existing pool of knowledge and practice, give voice and invite different perspectives, think outside the box, build corporations and co-create. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That is such a rich um, um, sharing, and and I think it's 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 really fascinating to 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 learn from you and the way you, you transform um, a, a kind of an experience of of a collection in the museum. And I think the 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 task of engaging the broader audience. And and I think when we're talking about architecture in Indonesia, we shouldn't just thinking about um, students in architecture or architects themselves, but obviously we, if we, we want to make history accessible, we need to reach out to the broader audience. And I think it's, it's, it's very important that you underscore, you know, this, this uh, multiplicity of, of interpretation of the collections and that, that you know, the, the narrative is not linear. There's, there's no one storyline. You create multiple entry points to, to, to explore uh, the contents. Um, so in the way that that you 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 brought it up, brought it up the the the, the value of the collections uh, or uh, the possibility for that collections to be to be understood and 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 to be explored by by the visitors. And and I, I like your ideas that we're dealing with in, in dealing with engaging the the millennial. They have a different way of digesting information. Um, and and certainly this is also transformation that. I'm currently dealing with in the education sector. Um, uh, they are not, uh, you know, exploring materials in the way we did. Um, uh, they do less reading, but somehow they can scan multiple source of information and multiple media at the same time. Um, so thank you, and I, and, and I, will, um, I trust that there will be many questions uh, uh, towards the end. And, and thank you for sharing uh, that that experience. And, and I, I think, you know, experimentation. Um, thank you. Um, I, I would now like to um, uh, shift into our next uh, uh, contributor. Um, I'm really looking forward for the conversation with Patio Santoso. Um, uh, Patio, if you can uh, start your video, um, that would be great. Um, and so the, the theme of, of our next conversation is about um, a conversation about the experience of teaching and knowledge transfer. Um, your Santos also knows Germany and Indonesia very well. Um, he worked in, the, in, the, in urban planning, uh, policy making, urban development, and participatory planning, and as a lecturer and researcher at academic institution. Um, so we will we will speak with him about the nature of knowledge sharing in this different context, the influence of years of, of studying um, and collaborating with um, um, the academic communities in Germany. Um, and but first of all, from my own, uh, to be a bit selfish, I just want to introduce Paio Santos so as one of the pioneering academic figures in Indonesia that for my generation and Satya Di generation, um, um, but your Santoso um, um, remind us there's a different type of engagement with architecture as a body of knowledge. You don't have to become a practitioner, uh, um, someone who design and build, but you can become kind of a, 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 a rigorous academic scholars exploring and expanding knowledge about architecture and urban history. So, but your um, I guess my question is, um, you know, um, as someone who are known, who is known to to teach urban planning, uh, in fact, the majority of your writings is really um, um, a, a strong historical research. So I would like to understand, um, you know, this 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 idea of um, developing uh, your career as a, an academic in urban planning, but in pretty much informed by historical research. If you can share with us um, uh, the starting point of that. Thank you, Amanda. Our last meeting was in Bandung, huh? Correct. <laughs> A couple of Before years Before the ago. pandemic. <laughs> yeah, during the pandemic, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, everybody, I'm very honored to be invited here because uh, it is it is a rare a rare opportunity for me, you know, to talk about my work because normally I I work in a silent room and then only uh, you know with some question with this for the majority of the architects are not interested, you know, so you now that's, uh, and with Sopandi, I, with Chung, I once discussed why they are not interesting anymore. As a you, you and Satyadi, uh, maybe the last architect of Indonesia who is interesting in about what I'm working for. <laughs> But okay, uh, uh, you know, uh, for everybody, uh, I think I have to. I owe you to 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 tell you to share with you a little bit about my background, uh, what I'm doing in 15 years in Germany. You know, 15 years is a is my well, my first job, my first study, study, my first love, with my first broken love, uh, broken heart. Uh, was uh, did happen in in Germany, not in Indonesia. So uh, I started. Uh, who are influencing me? Also directly, I see uh, academically, for instance. And then, but more important is the positioning of architect or urban planning uh, in as a, in in the, the problem of cts in general a problem of society in general so i think the first of the first of all is uh uh i have the i have the opportunity to to be near to some very very genius people like julius posner walter hamer ludwig leo etc because I was uh, a scientific assistant in under Hadika in Berlin, yeah, and then uh, there I have time to to study uh, what I like. Uh, it is a more uh, uh, architecture theory and culture, and then influenced me for uh, for instance very very strong Aldo Rossi. Lewis Mumford and Colin Rowe, uh, such people are very, very, have a, as a, from 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 that time until now, I'm still, you know, uh, following their 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 uh, their way of thinking. For example, I first time. Uh, uh, okay, of course, I I understand. That people have their own uh, their own position uh, to the tradition. That be, uh, but uh, once from once, uh, Julius Posner told to me directly that uh, yo you have to. Uh, he know that I work about uh, the history of city in Indonesia, and he said yo you 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 have to know that tradition was the result of an effort of a generation. You know, uh, existing situation is not uh, is not uh, what you an incident. It's a it's a result of the struggle of people, you know, uh, to solve the problem of how how and uh, to to give a thought how how they want to live. You know, the way of life, the way of urban life they want to have. So they struggle for it, you know, generation-wise. Yes or no? And then if you read if you read Aldo Rossi, then Aldo Rossi said that uh, the, the, the biggest mistake of an architect is, you know, that to see as existing situation only as a blank uh, uh, paper, you know, that you can draw everything uh, uh, what you want. Yeah. So and then and Rossi has uh, you know, uh, suggest that architects should pay respect to the existing situation and then let the city speak for their own interest. This 
these things is very important for me, you know. The second important is that my, my coming together with the Ars Plus people, from Werner Dürr, the D Dieter Thomas Hachsam, with the founder, Gunter, Gunter Ulrich, etc. What I learned from them is the dangers of the, of the modern architecture, that if we create something with our architecture, so we are not only creating something what we want to create, but also unintentional impact of what we are doing, we have to deal with that, you know. We have to bring to we have to deal also with the whole impact of our uh, what you call uh, making, you know, and not not only concentrate on on uh, pieces of result and then say uh, we put it uh, in the row together. That that's also in 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 in, ex in exhibition. You you have to do that, you know, because you have to focus on on a certain kind of of topic, you know. So you you lift up the result, you know, but you relatively often what the architect done is they talk, they don't talk about the about the problem, they don't talk about the negative impact of what it, what they're doing, you know. So what it's I the learned aftermath, from, yeah, the aftermath of the building. Yeah, the, yeah. What I learned from water uh, water uh, hammer, how he how he uh, upgrade. So section in Berlin, you know, with what they, uh, what he said, behut sama uh, upgrading, you know, uh, as a soft soft way of upgrading, you know, and and for Ludwig Leo, I have I have very respect for him, how he and tried to understand the existing sit situation, you know, he said one to me, yo, if I don't understand. The existing to situation, I give the order back to the owner. <laughs> He's really doing that, you know. If he he got an order, the first thing he understand, if the first thing he do is to study the existing situation, and to combine with the probably potential idea what he can produce. He said, if I don't have, if I uh, not don't have. If I fail to connect the existing situation with my idea, idea, I give the order back. He said, "You know, okay." And 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 then, but you, you know, in 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 kind of unpacking the existing situation. For example, in in Jakarta, I mean, like um, yeah, in, in, yeah. But yeah. when you return, when you return from Germany, so yeah. really, um, we I think to certain periods in in um, post independent era in the seventies and eighties is almost that the the past is inaccessible. You know yeah, there is yeah. so little yeah. data and information. So how do you I, I, how do you then I, find your way to to? Yeah, I, I face I face the situation exactly. You know uh, how as I was I spent nine years of my career in 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 the new city BSD and. Believe me, how many times I fought that to I try to integrate the existing kampung with the new city, and the developer didn't like it. You can you can understand the developer want to to build uh, a clear you know here's the progress. You are the kampung. You are the underdeveloped. You know. So that is uh, on the other side. That is I know from because I study. History, that is the heritage from the colonial Dutch city, because the colonial Dutch city was established to demonstrate, you know, the uh, you know the superiority superiority of the Dutch European culture, yeah, and stigmatize, yeah, you know, the indigenous kampung as something underdeveloped and as something dangerous as something. You know, poor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Until now, the practice in Jakarta and in other city also in Indonesia is: if you build, design the real estate, you have to build a fence or you have to build a wall uh, to to separate your your design, your new development 
with the existing one. That is the totally ignorance of the existing situation. So uh, that is that is the the the, the thing that I uh, uh, what you know uh, I face. And then, uh, uh, but Mandy, I I got some some help huh, from my senior. <laughs> Uh, discussing with my senior, but that is not Hanawal or the or the or the uh, uh, Hanawal or 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 other. Uh, but you, Supanda, know know about it. I go to Hasan Purbo. I discuss my problem with Pahasan. I discuss my problem with Robi Sularto. I discuss my problem even with Romo Mangun. You know, and of course with Johan Silas, for example. You know that that are, I think, the person who who understand the the uh, my inconvenient to work with modern technology. If it is create more problem, I create other problem, unintentional impact. You know that I separate the society, etc. So that is a jump you now. I so I think from the first time, from the first time I dealing with the problem with in Indonesia, I my effort is very, very dominating by how to integrate, you know, uh, uh, element of city is a heritage from the tradition of the system, modern one or certain how how we can bring it together as a as a you know you you can say a new convention a new consensus you know that both sides can identify identity themselves uh, as a as a as a part of the culture you know yeah. and that is not and, easy yes and i think um if you can just um summarize in terms of uh, accessing the social history of the place as something that that should inform you know um, um, the way we we shape the so-called modern cities in Indonesia um, how do you um, can you kind of describe your your method in, in working with um, traces of the social history of the past and 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 um, what what is the most important um, entry points to the social history of Jakarta in this case. Yeah, uh, that is that is already uh, a part of the content of my my book about the fifth layer of Jakarta where I try I try to show that uh, since fifth since uh, 1602 as the Dutch coming, to Jakarta and then established their new headquarter. They moved the headquarter from Ternate to Jakarta because they see the possibility, the strategic posi a position of Jakarta to elaborate their, their agenda uh, uh, to expand the trading, uh, the colonial trading. Uh, so the Dutch concentrate on what they need to support the trading colonial system. The Dutch didn't have any interest and didn't, didn't have also within, within the Batavia. Batavia was practically is not a city. It's, it's a headquarter of uh, uh, FEOC. That's FEOC. It is a... It is a cantor, <laughs> it's an office, you know, but an office of a company, the biggest company in the world, the richest in the world at that time, you know, and they have a very strong navy to support what they want to do, yeah, including the Royal Navy of, of the Netherlands, of the, yeah. The and real I, city, yeah. uh, I, I just want, the real city can only survive because behind the Batavia was what, what I call the city of the free migrant. 
The city is not organized by the by by the uh, organized by the Dutch, but people coming from all over the world because uh, everybody want to do something Chinese, for example, etc. And this city of the free migrant behind Jakarta in the surrounding of Jakarta took over the function of the city. In fact, because Batavia itself is is an office. You know, this is that is the colonial history I like to share with everybody. That uh, the next, the same, the next period, the same. That the Dutch want to build, you know, to establish a kind of a Dutch culture in Indonesia, and then coming people, you know, all, all, all the modernists. Uh, study in Delft and back to Jakarta and back to Batavia and help the VOC build the Dutch city. We call it here Welter Freden or Menteng now as Gondang Dia, etc. It was to demonstrate, yeah, from the beginning, it was to demonstrate their superiority against the local people. Yeah, and the local people, yeah. uh, the local people, well, is limited they 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 not allowed to to live in the Dutch city something like that and this is yeah. now is still yeah. there is still yeah, there this, and then, this, this urban deficient yeah this yeah urban deficient. Deficient as a, here is real estate yeah. I'm a better one you are yeah. uh, you are underdeveloped you yeah. are in the kampung yeah you know? yeah and and yes thank you thank you very much Pat, you for for sharing some aspect of your book and and then indeed you know this this your book um it's an important reminder of of the complex social history of jakarta and and i think this is this is a really good transition to our next speaker uh suryana herlambang um yeah. who also um you know um play a major role in in um you know um collecting and discovering um, um, historical uh, data about the city. Um, and it's, it's my uh, pleasure to, to introduce Suryana Herlambang, who has conducted studies on um, uh, Suryana Herlambang, who is a senior researcher uh, at Universitas Tarumanagara, um, Department of Architecture and Planning. Uh, Suryana teaches urban planning and real estate at the at Tarumanagara University, and he is a graduate um, from Diponegoro University, and holds master degree from Erasmus University Rotterdam um, and Lund University in Sweden. His interests include land use, sustainable development, and urban transformation. Um, and um, you know, uh, uh, Suryana has the, uh, prepared um, um, a. A presentation, and I would um, welcome Suryono to to share. Um, and and the, the topic of of um, his talk is about how can research contribute to public discourse, and and then um, how in a in a way that you know we would like to understand um, your research and your methodology in discovering important historical data about Jakarta that makes the history of the city legible, and that makes um, previous governance of the city in, in a way accountable. Over to you, Suryana. Uh, thank you, Mandy, and uh, uh, good day, everybody, uh, to uh, who involved this <coughs> uh, symposium. That uh, I start, uh, I try to start to uh, start presentation, Mandy, about uh, our uh, uh, current research. Uh, before that, that uh, I interested when Pak Yo said that uh, he always uh, uh, walk in the silent room. Actually, uh, I'm one of the next of Pak Yo. We we also <laughs> close to the uh, uh, similar room with uh, Pak Yo in Tarumanagara University. Uh, uh, for me, I think uh, I have a two two period of the. Uh, uh, my research. Uh, the first, I think, in the 2000, I uh, I more focus on the architecture and building uh, 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 period of the architecture of Indonesia. But after I finished uh, my master in uh, in Rotterdam, I more uh, uh, changed to uh, focus on the urban area. That 
uh, when Payo start to think about the uh, colonial and pre-colonial and the, uh, in the early post-colonial period, then uh, we, uh, some of the young lecturer in uh, urban planning department, start to think that we should think the different uh, uh, topic. And we start to research about the uh, current uh, uh, contemporary uh, metropolitan Jakarta that uh, is about to uh, start in 2010. I think uh, we start to uh, collect and then uh, make a map of the uh, 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 transformation of Jakarta. So I think uh, we, we, we start uh, to uh, 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 make a narration of the uh, current uh, condition of Jakarta. This uh, uh, I, I will share the short uh, presentation. I think this one. Uh, uh, yeah, I. I. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, for the uh, uh, data about the uh, post -col uh, colonial era or the early post colon uh, early post colonial era. Uh, it's quite uh, easy to find uh, uh, the data. It's like this uh, map uh, Jakarta in the uh, 1959. Uh, we call it a pre-metropolis. Uh, uh, Pak Yo said uh, uh, before as the uh, a city and the kampung uh, uh, still blur. And then uh, in the 16, uh, uh, in the uh, 60, we, we uh, Payo said that uh, after uh, some of the uh, uh, young architects from Delft and also from the US uh, came to Jakarta and they start to think about the uh, uh, modern of Jakarta, modern city of Jakarta. And it's, they start to introduce the neighborhood concept uh, in Jakarta. Then. Uh, we can uh, uh, find uh, uh, the, the map. But after Suharto era in the uh, 80s, 90s, I think it's a, it's a gap of the data of, of uh, Jakarta. It's uh, difficult to find uh, 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 the comprehensive data about the Jakarta. So then uh, 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 I, with uh, my colleagues, in, we call uh, Center for Metropolitan Studies in Untar, Centropolis. We start to think about the, uh, the the mapping of of Jakarta. So we start in uh, in the new uh, order uh, uh, new order era uh, 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 in uh, Orde Baru we, we call in Suatu era. We start to think about the uh, mapping about the new development, a large scale uh, property development in the metropolitan area, and also we start to think uh, to uh, make a dot about the shopping mall. And then uh, we continuing this uh, uh, map and the data. We use the method uh, combined with the uh, real estate uh, market uh, research because uh, we have uh, some of the projects, small project with the uh, uh, market research on real estate. Uh, annually, we we we, we uh, compile the data about the new project, and when uh, we put in in our uh, a big map of the Jakarta. So uh, we start this. Uh, uh, in uh, Suharto era, and then uh, continue with the in the ASEAN crisis in the uh, 1980s, we call as the early reformation era, and then uh, continue to the uh, post ASEAN uh, crisis when uh, 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 Newton start to recovery, especially with the uh, infrastructure in 2005 uh, in Jakarta, uh, uh, major infrastructures like a toll road, and then uh, 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 some of the uh, 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 arterial road uh, uh, built by uh, uh, president. So we start that uh, now that uh, uh, the change, the transformation of the uh, metropolitan area of Jakarta. And then we start also to uh, continue the uh, put the data about current condition that we start to know that uh, is the current condition of a uh, 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 metropolitan Jakarta that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, it's about the 20 years of the uh, Newton development in Jakarta. Then we start to uh, characterize that, uh, or we found that uh, three characterize of the uh, Newton area is in its area, in southern area, and then the west area of Jakarta. Uh, uh, 
and then uh, when we start to think about the uh, 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 more uh, 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 advance of the in, uh, public infrastructure, uh, infrastructure major infrastructures like MRT, and then we have. Uh, Jakarta start we uh, have the uh, has the uh, LRT and then also the uh, BRT and suddenly uh, President Jokowi uh, 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 declared that we should remove the or relocation of the uh, capital city. But we know the 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 condition of Jakarta metropolitan is quite uh, more complex than uh, 30 or 20 years ago that uh, uh, before that. We know that uh, we start to know that uh, uh, the autonomy uh, policy, the decentralization policy, is uh, start to uh, 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 make uh, more complex about the governance of the metropolitan of, of Jakarta. So uh, we also uh, far of uh, uh, found that the data is uh, we call as a. Uh, 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 pemecahan uh, with what what we call as a yeah in in the other side that the uh, 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 the capital and the uh, uh, big capital and the uh, uh, we call uh, in in the capital is like uh, the big uh, developer they start to uh, consolidating. You know, in 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 uh, uh, metropolitan Jakarta, not more than uh, five or six big developer. Uh, most of them is uh, is part of the uh, consolidating uh, era uh, in in uh, uh, in the post uh, 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 crisis, and then they start to rescaling the capital. Uh, you know that uh, uh, now in our research that uh, the metropolitan of Jakarta now is as, uh, as a a connecting or a direct connecting with the a global capital. So uh, we start to uh, also to put all of the uh, story about this uh, 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 condition to make uh, more clear uh, the transformation of the metropolitan Jakarta. So it's uh, ongoing uh, uh, research, Mandy. We, we uh, continue uh, uh, everything that uh, uh, we get in uh, a market and then put in in the map. So the other thing we also research about the uh, a, a spatial spread of COVID is also interesting because uh, uh, when we uh, uh, release this uh, a map, uh, 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 somebody said it's, it's a hoax, it's not the real because we uh, 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 copy or we we uh, put the uh, uh, the spread spatial spread of the COVID uh, every week. So every week we put a uh, 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 different uh, uh, color, and then sometime in in uh, 30 September is more of the uh, Jakarta has become a black uh, color, and the people uh, uh, start to uh, uh, worry about the uh, spreading of the uh, COVID. So uh, it's a two of the our uh, uh, current research, uh, Mindy, about uh, we uh, try to mapping uh, everything in Jakarta to uh, make uh, a more uh, uh, clear the data of the Jakarta. Yes, I think this one of the, uh, the last uh, 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 slide. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mas uh, Suryono. And I think um, it, for me, it's always fascinating, um, you know, your uh, the, the diligence by which you collect data and then you represent that. And so we can actually start to read the complexities of Jakarta, the speed by which it has transformed and um, and and somehow to kind of really make sense of what has occurred in the city. And, and I'm really mindful that many international scholars in the field of urban studies uh, really rely their collaboration with you to, to uncover this, this solid data um, about the city. Um, I guess I would like to kind of unpack a little bit that um, today, you know, we, 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 we talk about everything's like a snapshot, you know, everything we move from one theme to another. And 
and the kind of work that you undertake, it's, it's, it's pretty much hold on, you know, it's about reminding us the substance of what each moment means. And then this is about the evolution of Jakarta. Um, and, and how do you, you know, sustain that, that, that commitment to data when people shift their attention so quickly? Um, and, and how do you find kind of ensuring that public discourse slow down a little bit so everyone have enough time to digest the complexities as you uncover uh, in relation to Jakarta? I think uh, we luckily with uh, uh, Centropolis uh, has uh, uh, several young uh, 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 lecturer and also the master student, uh, 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 Mandy. So uh, in sometimes uh, we also offer to the student to uh, 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 contribute the, the the research. We prepare some of the topic, and then we can uh, they can uh, explore this topic, and the data can uh, 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 took in our uh, 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 basic uh, or the uh, big map. So uh, every time, every uh, 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 a new student and a new research that uh, make uh, our uh, a map or our data has become more richer. Yes, yes. Yep, and and then I think that's an important message that that map is in fact an unfinished um, um, artifact. Um, um, and so to to not assume that um, we we could arrive at a certain objective endpoint in in this mapping exercise. I think that's that's a really uh, valuable. Uh, point um, and uh, to underscore here and this, in the way that our exploration of archive is also kind of an infinite process. Um, and then uh, we shouldn't assume that there's one, um, you know, canon stories to be told. And, and I think the key message is to, to be mindful of the possibilities of multiple narratives. Um, so thank you, Pak Suryono Herlambang, for sharing that, that presentation. I'm sure there'll be questions um, to, um, at the end uh, for you. And um, I would like now to shift to our last contributors, but not least, um, but Laksmi Pamunchak. Um, uh, welcome. Um, Laksmi Pamunchak is an award-winning and internationally published bilingual Indonesian novelist, poet, journalist and food writer. Um, let's just describe the spectrum of her engagement, which is impressive. Um, she writes widely on culture and politics, including op-eds for The Guardian. Pamunchak's debut novel, Amba, The Questions of Red, has been translated into several languages and won the German Literature Prize 2016. The filmic adaptation of her second novel, Aruna dan Lidahnya, was screened nationwide in 2018 and had its European premiere at the prestigious Berlinale International Film Festival in February, 2019. In 2018, Pamunchak's first English novel, Fall Baby, was published in Germany under the title Herbskin. And one year later, the original version was published by Penguin Random House SEA and won the 2020 Singapore Book Award for Best Literary Work. She is currently co-curating an exhibition in Jakarta to commemorate the centennial of Khairul Anwar, arguably Indonesia's greatest poet. But Laksmi, you are invited in our symposium for two reasons. Um, as an important contemporary author, as I just described, uh, dealing with uh, your national history, but also as the daughter of Pak Mustafa Pamunca one of the featured architects in the Diplom Engineer um, exhibition. Um, therefore, you, you represent the families that the research team has been exploring. Um, so my first question is, how did your father shape your life and your perception of architecture? Well, thank you, um, Mandy, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, but before anything else, though, I'd like to um, first say a big thank you to all involved for this marvelous exhibition you've put together. It's two years almost to the day that my father passed away, and both my mother and I are very, very moved, very touched 
to have his work, his legacy and the memory of my father honored in such a way. And even though I still need to go on repeat visits to the exhibition to absorb it in the manner that it deserves, um, let me say that it seems to me though thoughtfully and uh, lovingly curated everything from the ambiance and the lighting to the sectioning and the display, you know, um, it's all first rate. So, so thank you. Now, as to your question, uh, but Mandy, there are so many ways, of course, in which a father could hold a lasting influence on his daughter, especially if he only had the one child. Um, with me, I think it was through his habits and his values and his aesthetics. For one thing, I was the daughter and the son my father never had. And I suspect one of the reasons he raised me was something akin to tough love, was that it was the way he would have raised a son as in uh, with rigorous discipline, not pampering me, not coming to my assistance uh, every time I got into trouble in order to teach me self-reliance and not buying me girly stuff, uh, but things that had historical and practical value. But what my father stood for above all was honesty and integrity. He abhorred people who were corrupt and nepotistic. He believed in hard work, in meritocracy, in accountability, in logical thinking, in competence in one's field, and also in the value of his own artistic uh, integrity. He never compromised as far as I've known him, not for money, not for status, or for whatever was trendy. He was very, very strict uh, on this. It was very principled. And he was very sure of who he was, the architect he was, um, his vision. He had no social envy whatsoever. He, he was so solid and exacting, sometimes so much so that home felt like such a you know singular place. Nowhere in Jakarta was like that. The rules and standards and habits I grew up with were very different from what I knew about my friends' lives, for instance. Uh, because of my father, I grew up with Western classical music for as long as I remember. I took up the piano when I was four and went through serious classical music training for many years. And when I was nine or so, my father made me study the violin because he himself had played the violin quite competently, I must add. And um, he was a tough teacher, as, as tough as he was when he taught me math in primary school. And even though I gave up the violin because I was hopelessly untalented, I hung on to the story of his having to give up his violin because the apartment building he was living in Holland uh, didn't allow the tenants to play musical instruments. And something about this always touched me for some reason. And in hindsight, the story was intrinsically part of the overall picture I had in my mind of his struggle as a student in Europe. So first in Holland between 1949 and 1957, and then in Berlin between 1957 and 1960, in that even if he was clearly privileged to have been there at all, nothing had come easy to him, except perhaps math and the sciences. He had to work doubly harder than everybody else and all in service of an overreaching goal to study as hard you could and to come home and help improve your country. So it is the notion of responsibility, a kind of sort of noblesse oblige to, to, to give back, to be useful to society, precisely because you were privileged to be able to study abroad in the first place. And it was this value, I think, uh, that underpinned my overseas education as well. He challenged me to rise to the task as his father had challenged him and not coming home was not an option once I said yes, that I was up for it. Subsequently, when I became a writer, I think he was deep down proud of me, though he came from a generation of parents to whom, you know, openly praising their kids was not the done thing. And he was also first and foremost an artist. So I always have a sense that he never begrudged me this aspect uh, of my personality. Um, the, the artist in need of a lot of space and time for contemplation, to, to think, to read, to reflect, to create, to be in her or his own, and to be immersed in her or his own world. So my father and I are very much the same that way, very solitary and, and valuing solitude above all. Uh, and the lack of this in our lives in Jakarta spoke to the same frustration we both feel, I think. But at the same time, he raised me as someone who's socially and politically aware. Political chatter was our staple diet at the dining table. And yet this was only natural, as you can imagine, as no art could exist in a vacuum. Now, this brings me to the second aspect of his influence, which is aesthetics. Um, so growing up in the house he built and being made familiar with the residential houses he designed um, have accustomed me to a certain way of moving in space, to a certain sense of proportion, 
of cross ventilation, of airiness, of, of lighting, of broad arresting swathes of light, colored wood and clean lines of uncluttered spaces of simple modern bold design details as opposed to ornate or baroque or overdone. Until now, I always believe them also attuned to flow because for my father, flow and function were key to residential living for it reflected the lifestyle, the priorities, the character and the personalities of the people he was designing homes for. And that was why he always insisted on staying for a week or so with his clients before designing new homes for them to get a sense of how they lived. So he wanted to know what they did after they woke up in the morning, where in the house they spend most of their time. Was it in the kitchen, the living room, the studio, the study? Were they morning creatures or night owls? So that he could design their homes according to these habits. Uh, and it was also very commonsensical about function and access and the, and the engineering part of things, about the location of bathrooms, about the functionality of them, about designing overhanging roofs that don't run off during the rainy season, for instance. I mean, this might seem, you know, very trivial, but these are, these are, this could be very, very crucial, of course, in, in home. And he was, um, as far as I could remember, he was brilliant in optimizing space, never a single wasted or awkward spaces in his houses. And they always designed in harmony with the environment also, meaning having a German or modernist aesthetics or Scandinavian aesthetics was one thing, but rendering it to suit and be at one with the tropics was quite a different matter. And that was what his Roma Tropis or the tropical house philosophy was all about. And he was also meticulous about good engineering. They was told me that like doctors, architects too, had to be held to high and exacting standards on every aspect of their craft because it would impact not just the habitability and comfort level of the residents, but also their safety. So I grew up watching him talk with his contractors and they stayed his contractors for a long time. And I always marveled at the level of detail he went into and his insistence on things done com competently. So, so that's the gist, I, I guess, um, but Mandy, of how my father has shaped my aesthetics. I, to this day, I cannot stand frills. I cannot stand over manicured perfection. I cannot stand dark, stuffy spaces. I cannot stand clutter, except what it suited the period and the function, like a writer's study full of books, for instance. And I believe good lighting, sometimes as simple as the strategic placement of warm table or low seating lamps across a room can make all the difference. Mm. So I think that's, that's a really, the way you describe spatial condition uh, is clearly reflect, you know, the, 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 um, just how detailed the conversation between you and father about, about space, about building. And I think that's, that's really kind of uh, telling in the way you describe uh, your sense of place, you know, of, of this building. And, and I guess in, I want to move to the next questions. Um, you once wrote that, um, quote, to me, my father had always been more German than anything else, end of quote. What do you mean with that? And what do you consider so typical German about, about your father? Oh, you read one of those articles. I think it's called My Father German or something like that. It wasn't my title. But anyway, I'd, I'd hate to be a, a cultural essentialist, but um, there were so many aspects of my father that would seem very stereotypically German. Uh, well, he believed in planning, for one, in structure. He loved order and precision. He believed in systems. And when I say he was systematic, and this is different than just merely being neat and orderly, which he was, and so was my mother. Um, but I'm not sure if it always been that way or was it due to his German training? It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, I think. He was fantastic in math. Uh, in fact, it was he who taught me math and my mother who taught me to read and write and later taught me about art and literature. Though It was my father who was the artist in our family. So on being systematic. At home, everything was organized and systematized to a T. Our book collection, our TV and audio system, our intercom system, I mean, you name it. And he even taught me to cook cleanly and, and systematically with the eye of keeping everything as neat and easily cleaned up as soon as possible. And uh, he was serious. He was disciplined. He was punctual. He also shunned uh, and even disdained self-promotion of any kind. So when I was living in Berlin as a writer, I found that this attitude was very common among my friends too, who were mostly writers and journalists and intellectuals. They weren't on social media, except maybe work-related Twitter for the journalists among them. But to them, um, the idea of having to sell 
yourself or your persona to sell your book was not just in bad taste, but it, it was also just, you know, wrong. And, and my father was the same. To him, what mattered was the work, not the person. The work was the ultimate testament and it would speak for itself. And he, so he would have hated what the world has become now. It is, you know, in this flagrant um, display of private lies, of narcissism, of self-congratulation. And to him, it was never about trophies and recognition because to be able to say you've remained true to yourself as an artist, biggest achievement. Um, there are other things, like he also loved to correct people when they said something and he thought it the wrong way of thinking. And I used to find that very annoying <laughs> about him and it would launch into long lectures and why it was the wrong way of thinking. But then I always found this habit of my father um, annoying, but it was not until I was living in Berlin that I found a similar attitude among many of my friends. Um, so yeah, go figure. <laughs> That's that's somehow you know I, I do I do like you know, like to avoid essentializing, but some of the characters characteristic that you describe it's something that I've experienced every day. Uh, given that my partner is German, so right. it's really funny. Um, and and I think I I just want to also um uh, go back to some of your uh written work. Um, there's also another in, in interesting sentence uh, that you use in your work. Um, um, and I quote here: the greatest depth. I owe my father is his habit of taking refuge in history, as he liked to call it. He often joked that it was a particularly German trait. What does it mean, you know, to taking refuge in history? Is it something that you were able to achieve through um, literature? Uh, yeah, funny. I was just about to raise the subject when you asked a previous question about how my father is more German was more German than anything else. And, you know, I, I think it is to do with how he perceived history in the first place. I also mentioned how growing up conversations on politics, history and current affairs were staple food at the dining table. Well, one day when I asked him to relate to me in greater detail his life story from the years leading up to his departure to study in the Netherlands in 1949, because I was going to use it in my first attempt at a novel, he was very pleased. He said to me, Every now and then, that's what we need to do, take refuge in history. He also told me he suspected what he said to me to be a particularly German trait, so this was coming from him. Now, even if he did not know that it would take me 10 years to complete that novel, even I did not know that. <laughs> uh, and then even if I didn't understand also what it meant by taking refuge in history, much less why it was a particularly German trait, it was while writing this, his story, about a male protagonist who grew up in an educated family in Jakarta, who became this idealistic, nationalistic, somewhat secular student in Oostgeest uh, and Delft in, in Holland and later in Berlin, that I came to know what that meant to take refuge in history or to use history as an entry point for thinking about the present, either as a way to revise misconceptions, think of alternative ways to think about the past, make sense about our violent past, and sometimes even find our way forward. So this approach to history, as it turned out, were to apply to my own craft. It applied not just to the first novel I wrote outside of Germany, but also the sequel to the novel, which I wrote in Germany, and had much to do with reliving my father's memories, but through a fresh and independent pair of eyes, my own. So by telling the first novel from the perspective of father and mother, and then by telling the second from the POV or the point of view of the daughter, I found a way to reconcile the two perspectives. And that continuity doesn't have to mean a loss of autonomy. And it is quite possible for a new subjectivity to rise out of your parents' memories and how they've shaped you. For instance, my father was a self-professed anti-communist student of architecture, but I made my main character a left leaning student of medicine. So I, I basically just shaped it into what I wanted, but the basic, basic um, feeling and the basic template and the basic uh, character was my father's. So as to how my father came to this awareness, I think it was the same with him as well. The Berlin Wall had not collapsed when he was there as a student. It only came down when he was interning there for one year after he graduated, but he'd seen and experienced himself how profoundly the divide affected lives and what it was like to live on one side of the divide and to live with the fright of history. And don't forget much of his own history, particularly growing up in Indonesia during the last 13 years of Dutch occupation, 
um, last, sorry, um, three and a half um, centuries of Dutch occupation, the Japanese occupation, 1941 to 1945, and the four year upheaval following the Dutch attempt to recolonize Indonesia between 1945 and 1949 had probably made him a naturally eager student of history. So I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Balaksmi. And, and and I think you know I'm, I would like to now move to towards the the reception of your work, uh, your literature works. Um, is there a difference uh, in the reception of your work in Germany and and in Indonesia, and how do you explain that? So when I came out with the novel, it's my first novel, Amba, in Indonesia in. 2012, it was part of a resurgence of new literary works in revisionist history and films, both by local and foreign filmmakers about the massacre of up to 1 million accused communists in Indonesia between 1965 and 1968. Quite a lot of uh, memoirs of ex-political prisoners, people who were imprisoned for being communists or suspected communists by the Suharto regime came out during this time as well. So there was greater tolerance toward the subject and the novel did well very well, in fact, both critically and commercially, and, and was even a finalist at the Kusala Katolistiwa, which is, was the, or is the most prestigious literary award in Indonesia. Yet many uh, Indonesians, um, still conditioned by the dominance of Suharto regime's official history, still found the subject of 1965, our shorthand for the massacre, a great taboo. And so the Suharto anti-communist propaganda machine, which was taught at schools and in public life, was so effective that many Indonesians, including my generation, have been so schooled in silence, you know, or, or forgetting. Uh, meanwhile, new generations like my daughters are sometimes even wholly ignorant of that period of history. Um, but the reception of my novel in Germany was stupendous. It was almost fairy tale like. Um, my, my German publisher went to such great lengths to look after me, including putting the novel at the center stage of every major bookstore in Berlin, printing something like 10,000 or 12,000 copies of the book in its initial print run. They organized an extensive European book tour through some 15 or more German cities, many I hadn't been to, all of which were packed, you know, full house, booking me for an incredible number of TV and radio interviews putting me on the pages of countless newspapers and putting the book and my face even on buses in Frankfurt and in video adverts in the U-Bahn in Berlin for a whole month. But then again, um, my main take out of the whole experience is the fact that in all of my presentations in every city, be it in the former West or East Germany, there was a profound interest and in solidarity on the part of the audience with the central theme of the novel, which revolves around 1965. Um, and even though many among the audience did not know much, if anything, about Indonesia, they were instinctively invested in our continuing quest to push for a national reckoning for what has happened and to make peace with our violent past as Germans have been doing after the Holocaust horrors of the Second World War. And, and this, this element of, of mutual interest a force, an affinity beyond language, beyond translation, beyond traduction, beyond culture was something that I could not have planned when I wrote the novel. But then of course, the, the larger context of, of that uh, book's success was that uh, Indonesia in 2015 was Aaron Gast uh, or the guest of honor at the Frankfurt Book Fair. So there was um, quite a lot of um, attention given to Indonesia, special attention. But then again, um, I, I found that that solidarity, that instant sort of um, affinity between Germans and Indonesians among the audience was my main um, take out of, of, of my experience. And sometime during my book tour, I texted my father in Jakarta, people are so generous here, I told him. Many of them never even heard of Indonesia and yet they came. And so my father's reply arrived swiftly. Well, I guess that's why you're there, he said. And I will, I will always remember that. That's wonderful. And, and, and sometimes we need a distance in order to see. Um, and we need a distance to, to be able to ask questions um, yes. somehow. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of mindful of the time, but I mean, if you, if you can um, now kind of, you know, like your father, you have worked and live in Germany um, and with your perspective, what can both countries learn from each other? 
Well, um, expanding on what I just said, uh, that particular episode um, of cultural understanding of almost oh, of intuitive, almost intuitive cross-cultural understanding sheds so much light uh, on the capacity or potential for continued dialogue, of course, between our two countries. I had the great privilege in 2016 to be speaking for 15 minutes face-to-face -face with Chancellor Angela Merkel at the birthday party of the songwriter, uh, singer Wolf uh, Biermann. She had just met up with Obama in Berlin to discuss the dire state of the world because Trump had just been elected. And the next day she was going to announce that she was running for the fourth term as chancellor. Now, Madame, Madame Merkel and I talked about the state of the world, about Obama, about Trump, about the EU and Indonesia, at the end of which she asked whether there was anything she could do to help the Indonesian people, to which I, I mumbled an, an incoherent answer, something to do with education programs, publishing or translation projects, etc. I then decided to mention our dire problems with rising intolerance. And she remembered much of her last visit to Indonesia in which she met our then president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, and I told her about Ahok's current predic uh, um, uh, then predicament about the sectarian thugs given so much leeway and how SPY has had a hand in the savage and systematic destruction of Ahok. And it pleased me that she didn't seem surprised, though of course it could also be because she wasn't aware of what was going on in our part of the world. And anyhow, the moment seemed like a testament to me how important mutual respect and good faith are to any bilateral understanding. And this ultimately, if somewhat negatively, brings me to the recent breakdown of dialogue between Indonesians and Germans over the very ugly, very unfortunate Documenta 15 controversy. I mean, a few weeks ago after the case exploded, I was invited by the German ambassador to Indonesia to an intimate gathering at her residence with two members of Ruang Rupa who had just returned from Kassel. Now, in the course of the evening, I was very moved by the humility and courage of our Ruang Rupa friends in the face of so much criticism, attack and um, hatred during their time in Germany. But far from being broken, they remained steadfast in their conviction and commitment to keep working and making art. And each rebuke is absorbed as lessons learned as opposed to ammunition to strike back. And I think uh, at the end of the day, it is this maturity, this, this generosity of spirit that struck me is the very essence of cross, of cross cultural dialogue. In this case, it was made easier by what seemed to me as a sincere reciprocity on the part of our empathetic German friends. And after all, a true dialogue um, is simply not possible without the goodwill to, to listen to each other and respect difference. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that, that that reflection. I think that's that's really, really important. Um, this capacity to listen um, and and to honor to be empathetic to one another. Um, thank you, um, Mbak Laksmi Pamuncak. And and um, we've been treated with such a rich and complex material um, this evening in my place and this afternoon or this late morning in in in, in Germany. And now we arrive at the Q&A session um, and, and apologies that we're running slightly over time. Um, and I would like to directly open the field to the audience because I'm sure there are some questions um, uh, for our wonderful speakers and contributors. Anyone wants to um, kickstart the conversation? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, um, Jan? Yeah, um, hello. Yes. 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 I'm Jan van Dolmen from the Netherlands. Um, I'm the author of the books you see behind me. We visited uh, the Documenta uh, exposition in Kassel last uh, October. And um, we were very moved by the exhibition. And we like to add that it was a missed opportunity because uh, at the Hallenbad, there was a very, very beautiful exhibition, but it was only in Indonesian language. There was no translation, no catalog at all. That's a great, great missed opportunity for Indonesia. But it was a very, very, very beautiful exhibition. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and anyone from the um, uh, who perhaps have an involvement with that exhibition would like to respond? Okay. 
and I think if, if, I'm just kind of reminding if, if you're not asking question, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. If no one answers, I like to say, I like to add some more to the discussion. Yeah. I was moved by uh, 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 Pasantoso uh, story. It was a very nice story, um, but I'd like to add that uh, during World War One, uh, that's the period of my books, for instance, is uh, that um, the Dutch Indies realized that they were very independent of the Netherlands. So there was a private um, movement going on to separate themselves from the Netherlands. And from these private uh, uh, people, there were uh, all kinds of, of new initiatives that led to, for instance, uh, the ITB and the Stovia, the, the uh, uh, educational institution for, for doctors. And um, this also led in the architecture to a very interesting movement of fusion architecture in which you, uh, well, you all know the, the beautiful buildings of ITB, but there were also uh, other Dutch architects uh, using Indonesian uh, uh, ornament on their buildings. And later when uh, the Volksraad, which was established in the same period, became almost too successful, there was a, a counter movement going on by which the, um, the ornament was again removed from the buildings like the Yafa Sebank in, in Jakarta, which was renovated renovated in the late 30s and uh, all the, the, the Indonesian Kalakops were removed from the building. Yeah. Uh, if I can give a short comment is that uh, the, the Dutch cultural policy to, to demonstrate the superiority of the Dutch European culture is backfired on their descendants. Uh, in particular, for the Indos, the yeah. Indos, you know, so that the misling. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason also for the for the movement to be independent from the motherland you know, following the revolution of the Boer in South Africa, you know, that also my speculation a little bit, I have to work out, you know, <laughs> the, the term Tanah Air, the term Tanah Air was, was in that context, was born in that context. Mm. You know, Indische Party, yeah, those Decker, etc., was also already playing the idea of the independent from Holland. Absolutely. Already. Yeah, yeah. And and that's 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 also what what our what our uh history book never never told us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, okay. The Indos become the victim. Of the of the uh, policy of the cultural superiority, you know. Yes, they lost their jobs. Yeah, that's yeah, they lost their true. job because they speak a lot of uh, uh, a very bad Dutch. You know, <laughs> can it sprechen? <laughs> can it good 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 Holland sprechen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, out yeah. And, and they cannot they cannot go up also in the hierarchy uh, uh, of yeah. of. Uh, 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 Okay, that's yeah. There yeah, was, there was a glass cool. ceiling for them. Yeah, and and and, and sometimes the colonial cultural policy uh, disguised the reality that is not black and white. And the Indo itself kind of represent the gray zone. Um, and I think at uh, Moritz Henning, uh, Moritz, if you raise your hand if you want to comment or add some questions. Um, you're muted still, Moritz. Sorry, I was listening for such a long time, <laughs> keeping my mouth closed. Um, um, I, I'd like to just 
shift the discussion uh, a little bit back from um, from history itself uh, to making history accessible um, and uh, connect Lakshmi um, Pamunchak um, to to um, well, we connect uh, Rajni Pamunchak, the uh, mentioned documenta issue, which I think is too big to discuss in detail here. And I assume that because of this, nobody really um, commented on this. Um, and that's the same with me too. But um, 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 what you said is this, um, um, what I recognize is this, missed opportunity and I think um, I'd like to connect this to our topic and the question how can we um, better use opportunities um, as we have um, like now um, uh, we have this 70 years of diplomatic relation was what 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 was the um, um, uh, the opportunity for us to show show this topic. And another thing um, um, was that um, uh, Lasmi Pamunchak mentioned um, that her father never did things like self-promotion and he was very, let's say, calm and conscious of his self, conscious of his work, but never took it very much to the outside uh, uh, to make a big, big issue out of it. And I think um, that this, if you characterize this as a German, um, let's say, uh, Eigenschaft, uh, attitude or, or something like this, um, I think that has its downside too. Um, because what we see now is um, that you're, your father's history is um, 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 shown for the first time, as as far as I know. I'm I'm from Germany, so um, I think I've missed uh, a, a lot of issues. But uh, to, to 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 learn more about this, um, but um, so this 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 way of uh, um, and that is something that happened. I'm an architect too. Uh, for the first time, happened to my generation that they. Ha that they start to uh, promote or have to self-promote. Right. And, yeah. and this goes, for me, this goes hand in hand with, um, with uh, the, the possibility to learn more about the architects and not keeping their archives and their stories in the back of their house, but showing what they are interested in and showing this to the public and make the public, not only the clients or uh, the neighbors to the house your father's, your father built, um, but to, 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 to make everybody more engaged in, 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 in discussion with them. Because um, especially um, um, when talking about your father, I think uh, I was very fascinated by, by seeing um, the, the the images of his work in the in the exhibition um, that um, um, you mentioned some 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 characteristics of his his architecture and I mean it's so important to talk about these things and to engage in public discussion and not only with your clients and a very limited group of of um, of, of, of of people. Like you do, you go on tours to Germany with your book um, and, and promote your book, tell about your book. So what can the architects make better and how can we make history more accessible? Yes. Um, no, I, we, were, we were mesmerized by the, by the scope and uh, and the variety of my father's uh, and the depths and the breadth of his of his work, as we, um, especially my mother in this in this case, um, um, rediscovered so many things and discovered things anew uh, in in my father's not very big archive because uh, a lot of his um, work uh, was stored at, at in Han Awal's um, um, firm where my father was um, a partner for, for, for many years because he couldn't um, open his, his own practice. 
because uh, that was the uh, the regulation. I mean, he was a, a civil servant, um, but uh, there was just so much um, in it um, that I felt a little more privy to because as the daughter, I, I think my father, you know, liked to think that one day I might become an architect. So he took me in his confidence. But for my mother, for instance, she um, she knew little about this treasure trove. And yet um, she's an ardent fan of my my father's architecture, of his of his aesthetics, the way he he looks at the world. I mean we were we were very molded by that, you know, and and now of course in hindsight I I'm so grateful for this um, opportunity to show what remains of his archive or what um, what we have um, yes, since um, discovered and unearthed. Um, and hopefully uh, with every discovery, there will be new uh, discoveries along the way, but I mean, there's no other way um, to do it, but to, um, to resort to this sort of endeavor, of course. So yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful and uh, I wish he had, Live to see this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And and Edward has raised his hand. Yes, I just wanted to add up on that uh, aspect of self promotion or of promotion at all or disco public discourse. I mean, when we approached uh, Yan Beng Oi in southern part of Germany. Uh, he is now over 90 years old, and there is one building which was ever published of his whole oeuvre. So I was asking him, why do, why did you not publish your materials and why did you not document it in public? Then he said, well, I, I never had time for it, you know. I, I was always doing competitions because all his... Uh, all his projects came to public competition. So he was working all his life for, for the uh, greater public and buildings for the, for the public. But he never got the idea that it could be important to promote himself or his work. And But this also has its negative sides. You know, some of his buildings are now being demolished, you know, and they are in discourse about demolishing because nobody ever talked about it. So there is no uh, understanding of the values of the aesthetics of the, the, the embedded cultural values within the building simply because it was never in public uh, discourse. And I think therefore it is extremely important to start this discourse on such buildings in order to find new ways how to reuse them and continue their life. I agree. Yes, and I think the importance of, of um, those who document, um, I think it's, it's also part of the process of accounting history or what will become the history of the place um because otherwise it's completely forgotten um and so it's, it's just this kind of dual aspect of self-promotion but also um curiosity and and um you know questionings um that that inform this process of documentation and reflection um and I would like to welcome the next question or comments from the audience, or maybe the speakers commenting each other's. What I'd like to add to the discussion is that uh, documentation is very important. When I started my studies in 1986, my teacher told me this is Dutch architecture and we know nothing about it, all the, all the aspects of, of colonial architecture was uh, was hidden. There, wa there was nothing at all. I had to write these books without archives or anything. So documentation is, I'm a librarian also, is very, very important. Indonesia need to write about itself and be proud of what they, uh, what, what they uh, are accomplishing. And they also need to look at the future of climate change and we need to look at the bright side of, of history also because we can learn a lot of um, 
of old architecture because they didn't use any air conditioning or something and still they create a good uh, um, atmosphere in, in their homes. So maybe we can learn from them and uh, uh, for the, the future. When you go to Jakarta and you are in one of those fancy hotels, um, sometimes you have to go out to eat because it's only 18 degrees in the restaurant. And when you lay your hand against the window, it feels hot, so they need double glazing. We need double glazing to keep the cold out, but they need uh, double glazing to keep the heat out, for instance. I would like to stress that we can learn from the past and that we have to look at the bright side also. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And, and I think I would just like to link to a statement that Satya D made earlier about the disparity of knowledge production. And, and I think um, you know, there's so many aspects of the history of Indonesia yet to be written. Um, and, and I think um, it is, um, we, we are hoping that more and more um, different narratives uh, are kind of um, constructed and then written in, in, in the future. And I think I would like to invite Satya Adi to uh, perhaps uh, share what you just put on the chat section. Oh yeah, this is uh, just a thought that I had when uh, we produced the biography of Silo Alba several years ago, that some people actually cannot help uh, suggesting me to compare uh, Silaban, which is actually the favorite architect of the or first president, which is happened to be a dictator for some time, <laughs> you know, like five or six years, and he he took like almost like uh, big projects in Jakarta into under his own hand, almost like individually picking everything by his own hand and taught, tell, tell his favorite architects, not only Silaban, but some other architects to build this and that. And some people cannot help uh, ask me to, to compare that. Uh, what, what, my, what is my opinion about Albert Speer compared to Silaban, which is actually not comparable, but somehow I also found uh, several uh, books and articles by, by Albert Speer in Silaban's residence. So he probably got like uh, something like a uh, premonition about his uh, his future when and when the, the leader that he served was actually under uh, scrutinized during the, the, the 1965 and 1966. And he actually wrote uh, several things that I still cannot produce to the public because it's quite quite sensitive and probably very sensitive to the family and also some to general public. And uh, it's very interesting for me to, to look when the time comes, and we can we can we can we can share that uh, safely about how um, about how uh, the life of architects can be can can be studied uh, by the the decision they made, what kind of uh, thinking that they, they, they had during the time, how to serve a certain kind of clients when when it is uh, very interesting at the, at the, at one hand and very very dangerous at the other hand. So it will be very interesting to look uh, the life of architects that probably if we put it in an exhibition or publication, we we probably see see them as uh, figures that we adore. But sometimes we uh, can learn much more about them and their, their life courses and, and to benefit ourselves <laughs> for the future on how to act and behave uh, properly according to our codes and and, uh, and our duty to serve the community. So there's a lot of to, to learn in the future by, by using archive and, and, and written notes and probably some records from, from the past. And, and I think um, if, if to go back to the, this diversity of content that, that um, you and your team have discovered, um, mm -hmm. The potential is to write the social history of architecture. Of course, yes. It's yes. not yes. about just the history of the building or the architects. It's the social history of the yeah. building and yeah. the place. Um, and, 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 and in fact, if we dig further, the social history of architecture takes us beyond the place itself as, yes, indeed. as we learn through the exhibition. Um, it's very tempting. And, it's very tempting. <laughs> it's yes. very tempting to um, do that. And 
I'm, I'm just mindful that we are kind of re, um, already kind of used up our three hours session and uh, there's really a lot of materials to, to reflect on. And, and this session is recorded and eventually it will be made available on the website and uh, something that I'm sure we will return to um, just to kind of reflect on the amount of, of, of um, food for thoughts. Um, that we um, we were treated uh, uh, today. Um, I I would like to thank all the presenter and contributors for their um, such a wonderful and engaging presentation. Um, and and again, I would like to thank for the opportunity to be part of uh, the discussion yeah. tonight and for all the participants. Um, and. Um, it is indeed a really kind of a fascinating series of events. Um, if you are in Jakarta, um, use your opportunity to visit the exhibition because unfortunately I can't go to the exhibition myself. <laughs> um, and, but I really look forward to, to uh, continue exploring um, the findings and um, you know, traces for future investigations um, about the history of um, architecture in Indonesia and the cultural exchange embedded in this uh, really rich uh, built um, history of, of the country. Now I would like to then um, um, hand back uh, uh, to Edward and Sally uh, to conclude the symposium. Edward, should I do that? Because you started. Sally, you can go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Mandy, thank you very much for this wonderful moderation. And I think one issue of the book will find its way to Melbourne um, when it's finished. And you can ensure that it will arrive here, Avicii. Um, I want to thank, thank also everyone who is participating today. And it's almost the end of our. A journey we started in summer um, with the funding of the Federal Foreign Office, and we jumped all together into this um, this story um, together with Satyari, with Avianti, with Angie. We didn't know we we didn't know each other in the beginning, but now we know a lot of interesting new um, participants of our network. I'm very happy about that. And I think I speak also for Moritz and Eduard. And what I have found impressive and very, very touching is that we had a lot of very young people in this, um, in this project, but also very, very old people. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, um, and so sometimes I feel, Sometimes I feel very old, and then in the next mom moment, I feel very young. And this is uh, a nice experience, and sitting here in Jakarta, sharing all this with you, and uh, hope we see each other again. Um, I think the story continues in one way or the, the other. I'm, I'm sure it will. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening, night, or afternoon, and uh, see you again soon. Stay healthy. Bye. Yeah, we like to we like to thank everybody for their contribution, especially like me because uh, the the story of 1965 is why my beautiful wife is here in Holland. <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> that it's being discussed now. Yeah. Yes. Thank so they also had the tribunal uh, back in 2015. I just hope uh, it will not uh, run out of steam. Um, yes. Very, very good to make your acquaintance. Thank you for being part of this symposium. Thank you, Thank you too. <laughs> Thank bye. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.